Welcome, everyone, to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. Thank you all for joining us. We apologize. We're a little bit later today, but that is for good reason. We are doing a little bit of a practice recap from today. We got some media availability for the site the day after the scrimmage. So we had both these guys, Vince D'Addario and Sean Davis, boots on the ground today for Notre Dame practice. After our recap, which will last about 20 minutes or so, depending on how the conversation is going, we are going to get in to, of course, our weekly mailbag. It is a Friday. So thank you Woo! all before we start. Oh, there's Vince, because I know he is pumped up about the mailbag. And I'm excited Always. to hear about the practice. Get well, it's my last questions. mailbag for a while, too. So, oh, man, you know. Is this like an ode to, ode to Vince D'Addario today? It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's a very sad moment in the history of Irish Breakdown. But we'll get into all more of that. Before we start today, if you could please like, share, Subscribe to the podcast if you're not already. Hit that notification bell. And, of course, share it with your friends. We are only a couple of weeks away from the official start of Notre Dame football. Yes. Uh, um, September 3rd in the shoe. Going to be a lot of fun. Sean, we already heard from Vince. This is his last mailbag for a little bit here, sir. But how are you doing, Sean? I know you got a chance to check out practice. Wonderful. Yeah, it was a great day down there. I think the first time, Vince, we were there together. It was really humid that day. Yes, it was. It was really humid. Today was more pleasant, more pleasant, nice weather, nice breeze coming through. Yeah. So, yeah, it was and it was great practice. Yeah, and we were in the shade most of the time, so you can't yeah. really complain about that part of it. So yeah, yeah it was a good um it was good for us, for yeah. sure. Nobody was tapping out because they were too hot or too tired. So that's always good too. That includes the media. Um and Today was uh, an open practice for us, but it was also an open practice for family. There was a lot mm -hmm. of family members there. Nice. Um, and so they were, uh, if I'm being selfish, taking the prime seats that uh, I would have liked to have so I could see a little higher up. But hey, mm -hmm. when the family's in town, you know, you, you, you allow that to happen. So, but it was good. It was fun to hear some of the conversations behind me from some of the parents and, you know, things like that. But it was a good practice overall. Uh, not. Well, I'll let you jump into it. I'll, I'll let you yeah. kind of lead us where you want us to go here, Ryan. Well, no, I, I love it, Vince, because, of course, you're the gentleman that's going to let the family – you would have let them sit there even if they, if you could uh, have taken their seats. But <laughs> we are going to dive into this day of practice, which, like Vince said, it's a little bit of a different format. I know I should probably introduce myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Roberts, the uh, director of scouting here. I am in the big man's chair today, Mr. Brian Driscoll, but don't you worry, because I know everybody loves to see Brian every single day, especially on Fridays. He's behind the scenes, so say hi to Brian. He's still behind the uh, the curtains, if you will, here at Irish Breakdown. So, Vince, I know you mentioned, and I really want to start out with this, we had a full padded practice yesterday. It was the right. last time that we will see them be able to take runners to the grounds, be physical, full padded, full contact true scrimmage that Notre Dame was able to have yesterday. Let me let, fill people in. Cause you mentioned a little bit about the family being there and, and a little bit of, but it, it was, it was a little bit more of a laid back non padded environment. If you just want to kind of lay yeah. out exactly what the format of the practice was today. Yeah. So it was very, uh, as you would anticipate after a full scrimmage that you take it a little bit easier physically the next day, right? Totally understandable. The stinky part is this is the one that we get to see the whole practice of, right? Now, I love the fact that we get to see the whole practice. Don't get me wrong, but I would have loved to see a full padded practice. So we get a little bit more from the lines and a little bit more tackling, you know, things of that nature. But it is fully <clears throat> anticipated that after you do a full scrimmage that they would be in a non-padded scenario. And that's what we had today. And from a schematic standpoint, when they were doing seven on seven and they were doing team and they were doing things of that nature – it was a lot of underneath stuff. It was a lot of check downs. It was a lot of, you know, running back swings, you know, things like that. I think two balls went downfield. One was by Drew Pine. One was by Steve Angeli. That was it. Everything else was underneath. And I mentioned in my practice report that the defense looked really good. They were flying all over the football. But I think some of that, a little piece of that, is that they knew everything's going to kind of be in front of them, right? So they were able to fly to the football a little bit easier and things of that nature. So, um, I think the biggest thing is people have to understand what the practice was like, and then all the rest of our comments will make sense. I guess that's the best way to put it. Yeah, I mean, you have to know what to expect out of it, right? It's it's not like you're going to get a I, I feel bad for you, Sean, because you know, I mean, you're the resident offensive line and defensive guy, <laughs> and you got to see a non padded practice. But we're going to get into a little bit of the main takeaways that we had today. 
If you have not seen it, I like Vince just said, he had his practice report that was published on the Irish Breakdown message board. If you're not signed up, you should go to boards.irishbreakdown.com. We'll get to a lot of the context, but if you want to see the full scope, the full practice report, I would sign up right there. It's below my pretty face. So if you want to go there, I would definitely check out. Vince, you, I feel like it's not the worst day in the world for you, despite there not being pads on, because you are a resident skill position guy. And I know everybody, as always, wants to start with quarterback, of course. Right. Well, yeah. Tyler there, Buckner yeah. named the starting quarterback. We have that answer, was named a few days ago. How did Tyler Buckner look just generally in this practice? What was your main takeaway from his performance today? Yeah. So clearly, Tyler was the number one. He had. 100% of the one reps, right? Drew Pine had 100% of the two reps. Everything is starting to gel out from a practice, you know, standpoint as far as that is concerned. I will say, and again, everything was underneath, a lot of timing patterns across the middle, uh flares out to the to the running backs, um hitches to the to the um slot man, you know, things of that nature trying to take advantage of what the defense was giving them, things like that. What stood out to me is it feels like Tyler's getting more and more comfortable with his receivers. The timing is better. The placement of the ball is better. Uh, one of the media members was sitting next to me, kind of leans over. He's like, I think people are going to be really surprised at the accuracy of Tyler Buckner once the season starts. I said, I think you're absolutely right. Because that's the biggest knock is people are worried about his accuracy and things like that. I was very impressed today with his accuracy. Now, did he force a couple of balls? Absolutely. But again, Defense was cheating a little bit. You know what I mean? They were coming down hard on some of those throws. Those are, it's not going to be that way in a regular game situation. So um, I don't think that he was doing a bunch of reads and things like that. I think a lot of it was very, very predetermined in the past game because they didn't want to show us a bunch of stuff. I get it. I, I totally get it. Tyler Buckner did not throw one ball past about 10 or 15 yards, right? Nothing long, not one thing. It was all crossers and, you know, uh, out patterns and things like that. I was very impressed. I think he's he's establishing a great relationship with Michael Mayer. Duh, that shouldn't be hard to do, right? Lorenzo Styles, uh, Kevin Bauman, uh, Loren uh, uh, Braden Lindsay. I felt like the relationship has gotten a lot better with those guys for sure. Yeah. And Sean, I know we're going to get an offensive line play in a second, but just kind of your general takeaways from Tyler specifically. I think one thing that really stuck with me, Vince just said, was kind of the comfort in his own skin in the role that he has. What was your just your observations of him as far as not only the comfort, but also the commands that he has? Because we've talked about this a, bu a bunch, right? Whether Tyler Buckner is ready as a leader right now, he is the de facto leader now that he steps in the huddle. He is the starting quarterback. So what was your takeaways from Tyler yeah. today? Just to add on to what Vince already said, you know, he is the leader of that offense. So, you know, he's the point guard of the offense. And I would say he is extremely comfortable running the offense, getting others involved. All right. From a point guard conversation. Is he necessarily comfortable shooting a three point shot? <laughs> that's that's going to come right. You have to shoot in order to get better at shooting. And that's going to come. And as Vince said, we really didn't see them ball down the field, make reads. But that's just playing that position. You have to play games and take reps to get better at those things. So the other things in the offense, facilitating, knowing the offense, getting guys set up, leading. And, yo, he loves it when it's an RPO. Like, oh, Vince, yeah. anytime it's an RPO, he's, man, comfort zone yeah. right there. So. We're just about to watch the maturation of a quarterback that I think eventually, right now, you have to feel really good that he might up be might end up being the best quarterback in the last ten years at Notre Dame. Yeah. He really he wow. might. He has that promise, and I don't mind saying it this early for what we've seen thus far. I feel really good about what he can do. I love it, man. No, I love it. There's big expectations. I have a great feeling about what he's going to accomplish this year, and we're just starting to get a little bit of taste of it. Appreciate the quarterback insight. Sean, besides for, obviously, Tyler Buckner being named the starting quarterback pretty recently, and what, perhaps the biggest piece of news that we've gotten from a Notre Dame perspective is, of course, Jared Patterson is going yeah. to be evaluated after 10 days. That was announced yesterday. and to see, So he's kind of a game-time decision right now 
for the Notre Dame's opening game against the Ohio State Buckeyes. So you t- you took a- your eyes on the offensive line, of course. I love mm-hmm. being able to chop up and talk offensive line with you because we are we are bred in the same way in that department. But you got to see the replacement for Jared Patterson potentially. So what was just some key takeaways? And, and more specifically, maybe to start, what did the left guard position look like today for Notre Dame? Well, you know, a lot of guys tried to hand it there, but Christophic was in there to start with the main group to start out. Uh, no, a couple of reps, you know, he ended up on the ground. He was limping a little bit after a couple of plays, but he got back in there. The offensive line, I think this has been echoed over the last few days. They're really good. They just really are. And they're going up against a really good defensive front. So when you see them kind of dominate and open holes on back-to-back plays or for a short period of time, and then, of course, the defensive line will respond and come back at them because of the competition, you know they're making each other better. So I don't – I think I was texting with Brian, and I said, I don't know – other than Clemson, I don't see any defensive line better than what they're facing every day. Like what they see yeah. every day, they yeah. won't see anybody that rivals that until they face Clemson in November. You might have a – I mean, I know BYU has a really big, you know, defensive line. But other than that, I, I really don't see it. I know North Carolina has some young, talented guys. But, yo – they're really good, Vince. They're yeah. really good. And all we – man, look, there's nothing better than trying to watch practice and trying to watch the quarterbacks or another position and just hear Harry just finish, finish, yeah. finish, and uttering all types of words that probably wouldn't be – shouldn't go across our airways right now. But he is on top of these guys. Like mm-hmm. – to the T, to the fundamentals, like stick with your block, move your feet, stop stopping your feet. Like constantly, he's going at these guys. I know that the uh, seven on seven, no, it was a team rep, the first team rep. He was getting on the second offensive line unit because they were trying to run the uh, play action rollouts. And the defensive line was just getting in the quarterback's face way too early. He, man, he just walked them from, the left sideline all the way to the other hash yeah. and into the huddle and was letting them have it as everybody else was switching out to run the next play. So just the coaching and the talent, you just expect them to dominate. You expect them, the running backs and Dylan McCullough all echoed it the other day. They set the tone. They and All of them said it. The offensive line has set the tone all practice, all fall. And there's nothing else to say, really. Christophic did well, in yeah. my opinion. Yep. He did well. Agreed. And Vince, I thought, he, like I said, I was just worried about whether or not he was injured. Jared Patterson, like you said, I don't think they're really worried about Jared, Jared Patterson. I heard somebody tell me today that he he's really fine and it's just going to be his pain threshold, you know. Yeah. So I think the starting line will be in there. But I'm very – I thought Billy Shrouth, I was watching, watching the uh, third year. I was like, oh, okay. They have some really young talent, and we already know the offensive line wave they have coming, you know, in the next two classes. So that's this offensive line unit is going to be pretty much, once again, what Notre Dame is all about. They're going to set the tone for this team as far as physicality. The blessing of it is, is now they have guys on the other side that truly challenge them on a daily basis yeah. and help to make them even better. And that is something maybe Vince has been closer to the program than me, but I can't recall a battle like this in the trenches for a fall camp with both, both sides just go at it constantly. Well, it's been great. And I, the one thing I did notice from an offensive line standpoint is that the offensive line was still moving the defensive line, even with Christophic mm-hmm. in there. Now, look, Andrew Kostovic is not Jarrett Patterson. No. I think we can all agree that that's the case, right? Jarrett Patterson is arguably the best offensive lineman that they have. So, but Andrew looks like he was a starter. Like, yeah. la- you know, last year he got about half the starts. He looked like a starter, you know? It's a step up when Patterson's in there. But as a group, as an offensive line, they were moving the defensive line. If yeah. the running back just fell over <laughs> where the offensive line stopped, they were still gaining yards. Yeah, We couldn't say that last year. Yeah. Okay. We haven't been able to say that a lot in the past uh, few years. Okay. 
They were moving the defensive line. That's huge. Even if it wasn't a padded practice, that's still something that we want to see. That's something that Brian and I had talked about a million different times is reestablishing the line of scrimmage, right? Yeah. Down the field. That's what you want. That's what I saw today. I did see that an awful lot, you know? So that was my biggest takeaway was as a unit, they were moving the defensive line, which which yeah. is great to see. Yeah, I think fundamentally that's my my biggest takeaway just from what I've seen as well is the fact that, I mean, of course I expect Harry Heastand to work its wonders with Joe Walt and Blake Fisher and all these extremely talented players, but – I it's the it's the physicality and just kind of the mantra of playing offensive line at the University of Notre Dame, which is my biggest thing that I'm looking for for mm -hmm. Harry Heastan. So even though Jared Patterson, if he doesn't isn't able to play in the first game, that's a huge loss. I still have confidence that a guy like an Andrew Christopher, to your point, or whoever else is thrust in there, is going to play with that same type of tenacity. To your point, Vince, and that was one thing that the biggest takeaways from your practice report was right. they were still moving the line of scrimmage even yeah. without with the absence of. Arguably, well, their most experienced offensive lineman and right. arguably the best right now. So great, great notes there, fellas. I want to say moving on now, Vince, this is our favorite time. We're talking some wide receivers. I know you're a big wide receiver guy. And two guys that we have talked at nauseum lately, honestly, is, is two guys that we are particularly very interested to see because one's a freshman, Tobias Merriweather, who has right. been – extremely consistent throughout the camp and Marcus Freeman talked a little bit about it. He seems to have just pressed through that freshman wall with ease at this point throughout camp, which is something that you have to worry about with a freshman that's coming in, especially one that was not there in the spring. Like this is a kid that was just, you know, just dropped off in the summer. So Tobias Merriweather's one. The other one is the newest addition to the room, which is funny because I'm just talking about a freshman as not the newest addition. That's Xavier Watts who spent the, uh, the majority of last, well, not the majority of last season. I think October through the rest of the season playing safety was a safety through spring. Now with the, of course, the injury to Avery Davis, Notre Dame needed to find another answer to the depth of wide receiver. And we've talked a lot about Xavier Watts, you know, having the opportunity to play and to really impact the wide receiver room in his second practice, Vince, take me through Xavier Watts. And then also, if you can hit a little bit on Tobias Merriweather, what you saw from him. So Xavier Watts is, is that they generally split the wide receivers up into two groups. He's practicing with the, the upper group, which is obviously good. I mean, that was one of the things that he had to be not promised, but Hey, you're going to get an opportunity to be with the upper group. And I think that's super important because that's where he deserves to be uh, during drill time. Uh, and I, I took a bunch of video of that during drill time. He looked good. He had one drop that, you know, just hit him in the hands and fell out. He, you know, he's got to work on some of the little things. There's no question about that. And Chancey Stuckey <clears throat> was working with him specifically on some of the little footwork issues, you know, things of that nature. Doesn't take away from his athletic explosiveness and his speed and all of that. It's just, hey, we're going to fine tune this thing. We're going to turn you into a top level wide receiver. That's awesome. He's never been coached at the college level as a top level wide receiver. Okay. So this is a great opportunity for him. Once they got into the team, he was working with the twos. Uh, he was also working with the threes. But that's more, hey, let's get this kid as many reps as we possibly can. Doesn't necessarily matter who's throwing him the ball. It's all about his stems, the top of his routes, you know, all of these different things. Made a couple of nice catches. There was one catch, and it was a, it was a, it was a third team rep, but it was a, a pass down the field. Steven Jelly put it up. He went over two dudes, yeah, put that thing down, and and caught it, and it was okay. I, in case anybody didn't already know, Xavier Watts can play wide receiver, okay? Like he went and high-pointed that thing and brought it down, and it was pretty darn impressive, okay? Uh, made a couple of nice catches over the middle earlier on. Um, you know, again, is he a polished wide receiver yet? No, and I don't think anybody expects him to be a polished wide receiver yet. He still has two weeks in a day to become somebody that they can count on or somebody that can at least be in the rotation and help them from a depth standpoint. He will help them on Saturdays. He will help them in the Ohio State game. I have no doubt in my mind. He looks the part already. Just the little things he needs to get cleaned up. And that's where Chancey Stuckey comes in. And you know what? He's doing a great job with them. And I there was one point where he made a catch on the sideline, I want to say, and Chancey Stuckey went up to him, gave him a high five. You know, it's like he's he's starting to fit into that room and fit into the culture and, and all of that. So it was really good to see. And clearly something I was watching pretty closely because I mean, look. Brian's a huge Xavier Watts fan. I'm right behind him. So he gets to be the president. I'll be the vice on this one. I, I'm a huge fan 
of Xavier Watts. And I'm really excited that he's going to get an opportunity finally back on offense. Yeah, no, nah, it's really exciting. Uh, Vince, just for some general specifics of the practice, I know we heard yesterday Xavier Watts was playing wide receiver and playing some safety, splitting between the 26 and the four jersey. Strictly strictly wide receiver today, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah, strictly wide receiver. He did not go uh, over there at all. Actually, uh, somebody that I had not seen at safety up to this point was Ryan Barnes. He, he lined up at safety with the third team. So I don't know if that's wow. – maybe that was just a thing today. Maybe that – maybe – Maybe they're just messing with us and want us to write something. I don't know. Uh, but it was the third team. I was like, wait a minute. That's 15 back there. And Interesting. He looked <sighs> uncomfortable is not the right word, but he definitely didn't look like he knew what he was doing. Okay. He this, looked this green. Is, yes. He looked green. This yeah. is a new <laughs> situation for him. That is for sure. He was just kind of out there. Um, yeah. It just kind of flow into the ball, you know, that kind of a thing. So, yeah. Um, so yeah but he was there for the 13 that's all i can say who knows what that means i'm sure we'll find out as we move forward but you know yeah. when you take a safety away sometimes you got to replace a safety i mean that, it's a domino effect right so uh, but no xavier watts is, is he's starting to look the part uh very quickly and you asked me about tobias merriweather too right and i was yes i went off on xavier watts but um <laughs> Look. Brian is Brian is just smiling and giggling behind the scenes because the whole time on Xavier Watts. <laughs> Look, Tobias Merriweather, the first practice that we got to see, like my mouth like hit the floor. It was the first time I'd ever seen him in person. It's like, okay, this is what Notre Dame's been missing at wide receiver for a really, really long time. Okay. He's he's green though. He is green. Okay. And one of the things that they were really working on him with was because he's so tall. And he's so lanky. He's got long legs. He's got long arms, right? Mm -hmm. It's getting low in his brakes and being under control, you know, that kind of stuff. They were really working on balance and staying low, things like that. Just refining what is already a really good game for him. Uh, he was exclusively with the twos today. Uh, I don't – he might have gotten a couple of three reps just because of a depth situation. Uh, but he was exclusively with the twos when they were doing team and whatnot. I mean, was making plays. He's everything that I expect him to be. The only question mark I have is how quickly they're going to get him acclimated to games. You know, what is his workload going to be in game one at Ohio State as a true freshman, right? What's that workload going to look like? You cannot have him on the sideline the whole time and expect to win that game. You can't. I'm sorry. You can't. He is a weapon that you have to use. So yeah. what does that look like? I don't know. But he has progressively gotten better and better and more confident in himself and in his uh, his movements and his ball placement, all of those different things, his ball catching. He's going to be special. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Dude's going to be special. Especially with the depth issues of wide receiver right now. Like Tobias Merriweather has to play. These guys have Absolutely. to play. I, I love the note too, Vince, of Ryan Barnes, because we're going to talk about secondary a little bit later, but a good little – I mean, that's a really good observation and very – different than what we've seen. Sean, if I could just yeah. get you to talk just a second on wide receivers, there's yeah. a lot of other talented guys out there, right? Lorenzo Styles Jr. I know Deion Coles, he was off on the side with Jane Thomas working it out a little bit. Yeah. What Was there any other standouts for you where you could just reiterate a couple points that Vince made about the other two guys? Yeah, I saw a lot of defensive backs frustrated. They can't defend <laughs> Michael Mayer. They, oh. they can't. It doesn't matter what route he runs. They yeah. can't. It's almost like they, like they cheat. You right. see it. They know the plays. They cheat, and they still can't stop. How about that tight end pick play that they had, John? Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic! And it's you can't like, stop that. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. Kevin Bauman setting the pick for Michael yeah. Mayer. For Michael Mayer, get out of here! And like, then there's... later on with the second unit, Vince, we see them running all different types of stuff with Holden Stacey and Eli Rarity. Right. It's right. almost like Tommy's like, "Oh my God, I have two <laughs> combos that I can work with." We're gonna run a four <laughs> tight end set at some point, you know? Absolutely. But getting back to the wide receivers, Vince, I thought the drills that Chancey Stuckey ran them through, like you said, focusing on balance, and I saw him point out to uh, Tobias and also to uh, X, Xavier Watts, just even in their stance, like get low. Don't lean forward. Get low in your stance and come out and just setting them up with that. And the thing they went with, with the fly route, you know, taking the contact and getting low and being able to take and, and accelerate through. And I was jealous because I wish I could do 
the other drill where they hop from one leg to the next leg to the next leg <laughs> and had to hold their balance and yeah. then come out of their break. It was like be balanced and come out of your break. And then, like you said, just I don't know, Dennis, did you see anything like that the I, last few years? I have <laughs> never seen that drill before. That balance drill, like that balance drill was awesome. You know, and, and I struggled with it at first. Now, they after did. they did it a few times, they started they to get it. But they've never run that drill before either. You know, you so, could tell. So just to kind of like give a picture, they had to start out on two feet and then hop and land on their right leg and hold. And they couldn't jump to the left leg forward until they held for like a two count. Yeah, yeah. And then they would jump and hold for a two count and then jump back to the right leg and hold for another two count. And the next thing was plant your left leg and come back to the ball. And it was like, yo, this is, yeah. this is insane. I wish I was like, athletic enough to be able to do that at this point. Cause it looks fun. Yeah. It looks like it, that's something that's challenging. And Absolutely. as a competitor, like you want to get it, you know, you want to overcome it. And I think they did well as a group. Xavier Watts caught just about every route, a pass that he caught a slant, he caught a fly route, he caught a quick post, he caught a comeback on the side, he caught just about every route you could catch today. Like yep. every route you could catch, he caught it. He took reps with the ones, he took reps with the twos, yep. and he took reps with the threes. It is, I think, the urgency for him and Tobias Merriweather to be contributors Absolutely. has gone up a notch mm -hmm. since last Friday. And we all know what happened last Friday, unfortunately. Right. Since sure. last Friday, the, the bell has gone off. Like, hey, you have to be ready September 3rd. Vince, did you see when Chancey got at Tobias Merriweather? No, I didn't. It was in this uh he was in a slot. Okay. He ran a great corner route, great corner route, and beat Jaden Mickey. And Drew Pine, it was high, but he's six four and the ball went through his hands. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. And play. he was running back to the to the huddle, and Chancey met him and was like, get your head around and catch the ball it was like yo but that's the urgency yes I love like it. yo I love you it. have to be able to make that play we need you as ryan said Deion cozy and jay thomas they're on the sideline cozy was wearing a knee brace jay thomas is trying to nurse back yeah. from a hamstring mm -hmm. like we don't know who we're really walking into the horseshoe with but we right. know we need both of you right to be able to contribute so right Absolutely. Yeah, the urgency is there. It's definitely there for that group. And well, I, speaking of sorry, the urgency, you didn't mean to cut you off, bud. Um, uh, Joe Wilkins was full go in this practice. Now, I don't know if he'll be full go if they're hitting. Yeah. But he was full go in this practice, was cutting, was yeah. making plays, was at the front of the line during drills. I mean, he looked like the Joe Wilkins of old, I will say. Um, I, he His trajectory is on, on pace to be a contributor on September 3rd. And That's great at this hear. point, they need that. I mean, I don't think he's going to start, but he needs to be in that rotation. He needs to be involved, right? And I think he's on pace to do that, which is great, which is which was great to see. Yeah, no, that, that was one of my favorite things that I took away from your report, Vince, is you just said it. He looked like his old self. And I was like, yeah. That's, that's great to hear, man. Like, as me and Brian have talked about it, and Brian's been kind of like, a little, I mean, slightly skeptical, you know? Because, I mean, he's coming back, and, it, you know, it's just kind of easing him back, and then, Looks like he's getting, yeah. getting to his uh, full speed pretty quickly, which is a good thing to see. Yep. So one thing you mentioned, Sean, which was a great segue into our next kind of part of practice. You talked a little bit about Michael Mayer can't, can't be guarded. I don't want to yeah. spend too much time on Michael Mayer, though. He's the best tight end in college football. <laughs> no. yeah. you, you did mention, though, that Kevin Bauman was a part of that pick play, right? So he had his yeah. role there. He kind of did a little bit of the dirty work. Vince, I guess I could start with you here. You mentioned in your practice report a little bit about Holden Stage. You mentioned a little bit about Eli Raritan. You mentioned about Kevin Bauman. Talk to me about some of the other tight ends not named Michael Mayer and just <laughs> what you saw them doing fundamentally in this practice that maybe a couple of things that stood out. So uh, Bauman and Mayer were predominantly the one-two punch with the ones. Um, <clears throat> there was a couple of plays where Kane Barong got in, uh, but they were few and far between. It, it was primarily those two. The, the second group with the two freshmen, uh, it was Barong and Raritan. And I'm sorry, man, and I know this is cliche, but they didn't look like freshmen to me. Like, th th those two boys are put together physically. Yes. Um, it didn't appear to me that they were running the wrong routes. You know, they were making plays. 
those those two can play right now, and I would have no problem with that whatsoever. And that's you know I'm not saying anything negative about Kane Barong or anybody else, but they weren't given any opportunities today because I think the separation has begun. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Bauman is that number two tight end because he's been around the program for a really long time. You, he knows what to do. He's trusted. He's a big body. He's going to be a great number two, right? The other two freshmen, though, if they're subbing in, they're going to be just fine. They're going to be just fine. And they're going to, they're not, they should not be afraid to throw the ball to either one of those guys if they happen to be in the game. Yeah. Period. And, and I love that they're working together because they're very different football players, right? So I know Brian just put a message up on here. Barong and Raritan aren't fully clear. That's part of it as well. It's a great point, Brian. Brian making great points when he's not even on the show. Tell me who else could do that. Hey, not many. No kidding. But Eli Raritan and Holden Stays play very different brands of football, which I like how it fits. And I've talked to Brian about this maybe two days ago, Vince, just saying like, Michael Mayer can do everything. So it's like any other type can fit with a Michael Mayer, yes, right? So absolutely. whether it's Bauman or Barang or whoever, ultimately as the number two tight ends, I think that there's a lot of options that can do a lot of other things. So John, I, I, I take it just kind of, you know, looking at you smiling and just kind of agreeing with Vince, you were pretty impressed with those freshmen as well. It seems like, as I said before, just Michael Mayer, you can't, there's a lot of hung heads today when he was out there taking reps. <laughs> Just a lot of hung heads in the defensive backfield. Like, we can't do anything with him. I'm glad he's on our team. Yeah. One exactly. of the things I pointed out, though, Vince, this was – this is when I said Tommy was in his bag today. I don't know if you saw this. It was second and third unit, and Rarity and Stace were on the field together, and they were both detached. One play, it was three wide to the left, other wide receiver to the right. This is 12 personnel, though. There's two tight ends. Yep. Raritan's on the inside to the left. Stace is outside of him. The receiver, receiver's outside of them to the left. Raritan runs like a hitch, and Stace runs a post behind it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Tommy's in his bag. Like, he's just like, oh, I can do so many things with the guys. Then he comes back in, and he puts the two tight ends on the outside and puts the receivers on the inside. Yep. And they just both run fade routes. And you get to choose. Sorry about that. You get to choose which one you want to throw to based upon the matchup. It's right. It's like it's you know, unbelievable. It's, I mean, yeah. Yep. It's incredible the way that this offense is going to look. Like they're going to take take chances, and you know they're going to be physical and run the ball. Absolutely. They're going to take chances because yeah. they have the talent to do it. So it's going to be exciting to watch. But yeah, the tight end room is once again. What it's always been in Notre Dame. Yeah. What it's always been. Man, you have, I mean, just so many different styles, though, which is what I'm excited about. I mean, you have Michael Mayer that's 6'5", 265. Raritan's almost 6'7", 240. You got Holden Stage who's like 6'4", 245, 250. You got Barang that's 6'3", 240 plus. Like, they're all just different body types, different yeah. styles, which gets me really excited about it. Sean, I'm going to come back to you in a second because I want to ask you about a couple of freshman defensive backs. But, Vince, you already started out to talk a little bit about Ryan Barnes getting a little bit of reps at safety. Who knows yeah. what is exactly up with that. But what were just a couple of key observations from the secondary perspective as we kind of flip over to the defensive side of the ball? Well, I know this is going to shock a lot of people, but Brandon Joseph is a dude. Um, I mean, he he's over there barking orders to everybody. I mean, he's a leader in that defensive backfield, telling everybody where to go, you know, flying to the football, had an interception. The one long ball that Drew Pine threw got picked off by Brandon Joseph. I mean, and it was underthrown, uh, but it was still a great play by Joseph because he just went up and snatched it, fell on his back, but still caught it. It was a great play. Um, I mean, the guy's a dude. He's just a dude. Um, surprisingly, or at least slightly surprisingly, is that Houston Griffith started off next to him. Now, they were rotating a lot in the defensive backfield, um, but it was it was those two to start. And then it was uh, DJ Brown and Ramon Henderson kind of running with the twos. But they were running guys on and off like crazy. So I wouldn't like put that in stone per se. Uh, but that that's who they were playing at safety. Cam Hart was making plays all over the field. They, they, they were not really going after him, which I, I think he's pretty used to at this point. Uh, but, I mean, he was making plays all over the field. He, he looks the part. 
um, of, of a number one corner. There's no doubt about that. Uh, right now, it's Clarence Lewis at, at the other corner, and it's Tariq Bracey at, at, uh, at the nickel. And they haven't wavered from that at all from the start of camp. So that tells me, and from what I've seen with my own eyes, those two are playing good football. They're playing yeah. good enough football to hold off the guys behind them, which is great news. So th- it's been that starting group the entire fall. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I, and of course, I mean, I'll, I'll let I'll let Sean take over on some of the younger guys. But uh, from the starters, I got exactly what I anticipated. They their trajectory is going in the right direction as camp goes on. As mm-hmm. I said, they were kind of cheating is such a bad word but when you're when you're at practice and you know what's coming it's hard not to okay so the dbs were making some plays there, there's no doubt about it they were getting their hands on balls they were tipping balls not a lot of interceptions today but a lot of tip balls so they, they were making plays well speaking of making plays sean we saw in the spring Jaden mickey was making a lot of plays and of course he has a Freshman running mate at cornerback now, Benjamin Morrison. So we've heard a lot about Jaden Mickey, obviously, from the spring into the fall. Give me a little bit on Mickey, but also more important, well, not more importantly, but more contextually from a Benjamin Morrison perspective. I don't know if we're calling these the guys the Eminem boys or if I know know that was a dad joke. I'm cool. It's fine. Tell me about (laughs) Benjamin Morrison and Jaden Mickey. Jaden Mickey gives Mike Mickens and Al Golden so much versatility. Absolutely. That Notre Dame hasn't had. Like you talked about Clarence Lewis. When Clarence Lewis struggled, there was really no one else to go to. And that's that's not the case this year, right? Because you can take him out. You can put Jaden Mickey in a slot and then push Tariq Bracey out, you know, to the field. I also saw, you know, like you said, Vince, Cam Hart. You know, he's almost like Michael Mayer on the defensive side. Right. Like he He's a dude. Like he he's the dude in the defensive backfield, but Mickey and more and Benjamin, they were all over the field today, all over the field, deflections in plays. Even if it was a running game, Mickey was putting his nose in the running game from the slot. He's just a tough kid. He's a really tough kid. And it just harkens me back to the matchup he had in the quarterfinals of the high school playoffs out there in California, when he went up against CJ Williams and, um, that squad and he would talk trash the entire game and they really outplayed, but they couldn't just couldn't score in the red zone. So that's his confidence. He's a confident kid. He really comes in with a lot of confidence. He plays that way. He talks that way, but then he walks the walk along with that. And Morrison is just really quiet, but he's solid. And honestly, you know, he got into a skirmish. Yeah, he did. Today, but I liked it. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. And I didn't Vince, I didn't even think it was that bad. I was oh, like, no. every, the red jersey is gone. What you mad about? Right. He, he tackled you. He tackled him. That's, a, that's a darn good play. Yeah, he tackled him. It was a it was yeah. a swing pass to the to the running back to Diggs, and Morrison tackled him. And he it wasn't him like a, it wasn't a hard tackle, but it was a tackle. Oh. And Logan got up all mad, threw the ball at him, and they push each other a little bit. Okay, yeah. whatever. They're competing. And that freshman, he did not back down. No, to Logan he hit him back. Yeah, exactly. I loved it. So you loved it. I'm like, okay, I like this kid. So the depth <laughs> of the position, and it's a position that I think Mike Mickens has taken a lot of heat for his recruiting. But if you watch Mickey and Morris, and it's like, there's nothing else to say about recruiting. <laughs> <position>. <laughs> it's like, okay, like forget the crew he has coming in 23. Like this crew right here, they're good. And they're going yeah. to play early and yield dividends. So how good – just the fact that we have that combo for the next three years, Absolutely. when you think about it, it's like, okay. Yeah, the depth is real and the yes. future is bright. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know we're, I mean? we're not even talking about Philip Riley, who I think also had a couple of good plays today, the young man. Yeah. So you like what you see. Yeah. You like what you see. They, re- In my opinion, Vince, they were at their best in the 7-on-7. Seven seven. Yeah. Oh, no question. There were 7-on-7, seven were- seven, the defensive backfield was yeah. making plays like the entire time that they went seven right. on seven. There were not a lot of completions during seven on seven. No, it's, no. A, it's like that they were reading the playbook of the offense or whatever. I, <laughs> yeah. I I don't know if that's true or not, but like they were breaking on balls. There just were not a lot of completions during seven on seven. They just weren't. Vince. That's not very, that's not very typical. That's a very offensive driven type of, type yeah, of not today. Part, part of practice. Yeah. Wow. Who do you think communicates better? 
Because this just I just want to point out the level of communication that's going on on the defensive side of the ball that we weren't used to. Yeah. And Al Golden was stressing that in the spring. Yeah. In a couple of practices that we went to. Absolutely. The yeah. linebackers are the defensive backfield. So it's like you have to listen. They both are yeah, perfect at the same time. There's a lot of chatter going on, and I'm not used to hearing it as much from the linebackers. I, I'm used to hearing it because, he, look, we had Kyle Hamilton back there, yeah, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and he was always putting people in the right spots. I'm a little surprised that Brandon Joseph is doing it already, right? I mean, he hasn't been there that long. And he, you know, he was doing it uh, in – the first full practice that we saw, he wasn't playing with the first yeah. team because they were working a man, you know, that kind of thing. But he's literally telling guys where to line up from the sideline, yeah. right? And now he's in the game and he's doing the same thing. Yeah. So he's clearly respected. He is clearly listened to. He's already a leader in that secondary. Um, and so I, I guess I want to say I expect it, but it's still earlier than I anticipated. You know what I mean? So I would say I'm more surprised at the linebackers because – they haven't always been the most vocal group on mm-hmm. that defense. And now you're starting to hear they are them now. often. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, it's great to hear. Vince, Ryan, I don't know if you guys know this, but 16 is greater than 14. I'll leave it at that. Ooh, that is quite the statement right there. That is quite the statement. Sean, you always keep us ready here, buddy. I'll, I'll say this, Sean. I'm actually going to come to you. Because we're going to get to our mailbag here in just a couple minutes, but I want to leave us off with just a couple final thoughts. You can talk about a couple of players that maybe you didn't see or just an overall arcing type of conversation. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we, we talked about many of the headlines. Again, if you haven't checked out the full practice report from Vince Adario, that guy right up there, go down to boards.irishbreakdown.com. But, Sean, a couple more tidbits from practice, if there's anything that we haven't talked about or something that you just wanted to kind of put, put the bow on this uh, practice talk. Uh, Prince Colley had a couple of plays where he just blew up the run play, just blew it up. And he was fantastic. The depth they have at the linebacker position. I think they started out, if I'm not mistaken, they started out with Bo, JD, and, and Kaiser out there. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, Colley they was coming in with Junior. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they were just shifting guys in the depth at the linebackers. It's just amazing. The speed is so. Everything is just so much better. They just play at a much faster pace. And you yeah. can see that they know exactly what they're doing. And they're not thinking about anything. You you can tell. Like, right. the coaching and, and the, the nuances and the philosophies, everything has been absorbed. There is no more trying to figure it out. And you love to see that with two weeks left before the first game that they can just go play. For me – that stood out along right. with the defensive backfield, just getting after it and making plays specifically in that seven on seven. And the one guy that, like I said, Prince Colley for me stood out. And I think the youngsters on the interior had a really good day in team reps. I really do. I, I saw Jason Onye flash Tyson Ford, you know, he ran off a little gimpy towards the end of practice and I hope he's okay. But just watching those young guys on the inside, this is a really good team. I'm sorry, folks. Yeah. I know people want to give the traditional Notre Dame answers, like they don't have the talent, da-da-da. This is a really talented football team. Yeah. What's going to happen on the field, we'll wait and see, but the talent's there. All right, well, Vince, uh, maybe to end this conversation, anything else you want to throw out there, any players that, that pop to you, any any final thoughts on the practice from today? You know, I I was I was impressed with the running backs. Uh, you know, the top three guys, they're interchangeable. I mean, of course they they're better at different things. Uh, but when you're talking about Chris Tyree, you're talking about Logan Diggs, you're talking about Audric Estime, all three of those guys could be bell cow backs depending on who's hot that day. And I would have no problem with any one of those three guys. Uh, Jabron Payne is still the fourth guy. Doesn't mean he can't come in and get you a few snaps, but he's the fourth guy. The other three guys, if healthy should be out there before him. And it's nothing against Jabron Payne. That's just the fact that he's a true freshman and, in my opinion, needs a little bit of time in the weight room, right? Needs to get that upper body a little bit strong. He's got strong legs, man, and he can catch the ball out of the backfield. Just needs to kind of work on that upper body just a little bit more. But if if all four of those guys stay healthy, the top three guys are going to get a ton of reps. And I'm I don't care who it is. I really don't. I mean, it's going to be up to the offensive coaches to have to decide, okay, 
Is it seven? Is it 25? Is it 22? Who's got the hot hand today? Maybe it's two guys. Okay, we're going two back sets. We'll put somebody in the slot. You know, we'll move them around, whatever. Those three, all three of those guys can play the game. And, you know, it was fun to watch, even though there was no tackling or taking to the ground today or anything like that. There were still a few plays where the running backs got loose, right? And it, I'm telling you guys, it, this is going to be a run centric team. There's no question about it. They'll put their points up on and, and they'll get their yards in the, in the pass game. But with this offensive line and those three running backs, just sit back and have some fun. Get the popcorn out because it's going to be a lot of fun. And I know you mentioned it earlier, Vince, but it was also nice to hear that Logan Diggs did not have the red jersey on today, oh. which is a great step yes. to be cleared on Monday, I believe, is when everything is full, full contact today, obviously not in pads. So that is going to do it for the practice report portion of this podcast. But don't go anywhere because we're going to get to the mailbag in just a second. Before we do, make sure that you like, share, subscribe to this podcast, hit the notification bell, <clears throat> join the message board boards.irishbreakdown.com and make sure to share this podcast. It is only two weeks and a day, as Vince said, Woo! until Notre Dame Fighting Irish kick off against the Ohio State Buckeyes. So continue to grow this great community we have at Irish Breakdown. All right, fellas, now that we have you guys for a few minutes here, we want, of course, it's a Friday. Vince's last one. I literally almost cried this morning, by the way, Vince, when I heard it was your last mailbag. No, right. Well, th there'll be a few Fridays off as we go. You know, there's a fall break yeah. in there where I'm just going to beg Brian to get onto the mailbag. You know, it's like, hey, please, can I come back? Can I come back? And we start our mailbag section off with the Spanky 412. Th Spanky, thank you as always. You were always in the chat. We really appreciate you. Sean, I'm going to need you to apply for the assistant recruiting director position and literally repeat the rant the same way to every recruit and their parents. That was phenomenal. I wish I was in there live. Sean, I actually saw this. I saw someone post on the message board that it started about 11 minutes and 50 seconds on on your, your podcast with Malik. And so I went there and I listened to your rant and I agree. It was a great rant, sir. I, I really do appreciate it from the recruiting side of everything. And the Spanky, we appreciate you very much. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get Sean a nice little, uh, I don't know, Sean, recruiting director. Does that sound good to you? Is that a good title you think? That sounds good to me. Just give me my plaque on the wall. I mean, yeah. my little name plate and I'm good. I'm ready to go. Love it. I love it. I love it. I believe we have a couple other super chats that we are going to get to, but Spanky, we appreciate you. This one is from David Carpenter. David, really appreciate it again. Another one for Sean. Hey, Sean, I'm here for the recruiting rant you brought. Question for you. How many double D position groups do you think we have this year? I don't know how to take that question. I don't know how to take it either. I don't, I don't know what that meant. I was hoping that you knew how what that meant. David, if you want to pop in the chat exactly what that means, because I was literally I was really hoping that was a lucky lefty thing. Like I didn't know what the terminology came from there. But David, appreciate the super chat. And if you want to put into the, the um into the chat now, we can circle back to this question and get some of Sean's context. Gonna go to John A1. I mean to ask Sean Davis, and we only have Sean for a few minutes, so we're gonna Make sure to get some of these questions out to him. Been meaning to ask Sean Davis, who are his top five prospects during his lifetime oh. out of the state of Illinois? Wow, Sean, this is a this is a doozy, man. Okay, I saw yeah. you in real time. To be fair, I started going to high school games and I was a really young kid at Gately Stadium, so I know a lot of. I Bryant Young is definitely one of them. Simeon Rice is definitely one of them. Donovan McNabb is definitely, without question, one of them. Um, only because I went to grammar school with them. Matt Cushing, that went to Mount Carmel and played tight end for like eight years with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was like a good friend of mine growing up, so I had to throw him on my list. If he ever heard this, he'd be like, dude, how do you not put him on your list? <laughs> and probably the great dude. It was this kid from Julian. He was a wide receiver, and he committed. He went, He played for George, George Perlis in Michigan State. His name was Brian. Oh, I forget his last name. But this, I, I kid you not. His, his senior year, he took back at least two punts every game. Like, he was th that dominant. It was like. Oh, this is crazy. How is he dominating like this? 
And for some reason, I think he had some injury issues, but when he went to Michigan State, he didn't blossom the way a lot of people thought he would. But, yeah, those are probably five of the best players I ever saw in my time. And there were some other – there were some other fantastic – Rocky Harvey was a – look, if you want to talk about a kid that just dominated the state in football, Rocky Harvey, a diminutive running back, you know, out of Dunbar in the city. He still holds the all-time record for rushing yards in high school. And the kid was like 5'8", 170, just dominating. He went to Illinois, and he had a couple of good years down in Illinois. But, yeah, those are probably five guys, yeah, that I saw personally that I laid eyes on. I know there are a bunch of guys that came before them, you know, the state of Illinois has, if you go look, type in top 100 all-time players, high school players in the state of Illinois, and just look at the names that you probably didn't even realize came from. Oh, another guy I got to watch play against my younger brother, Rodney Harrison oh. at, at Marion Catholic. He was really good. At that point in time, he was like a cornerback, but he was really good. He hadn't moved to safety yet, but he was really good he played against my younger brother. Nice. All right. Well, yep. there we go. A little bit of Illinois knowledge dropping from Mr. Sean Davis. Thank you, John, of course, for that question. Sean, I know you got a Jets, so I want to thank you so much for joining it. Awesome stuff from the from this, the uh, practice report and the mailbag, brother. Look forward to having you back on soon. Hey, thanks, guys. IB Nation. Love you guys. Appreciate you. All right. All right, Vince. Got some more. Oh, yeah. Hunter with another super chat. Hunter, thank you so much. Friendly neighborhood Cincy fans stopping in. Hope y'all have a great season. Rooting for y'all and Coach Freeman. Y'all have amazing content, by the way. Keep it up. Hunter, we really appreciate that. Even though the last time I was in Notre Dame for a live game, Cincinnati broke my heart. I appreciate your super chat very much, sir. So but I'll tell you, you so what, the, yes. the Cincinnati fans that I ran across were all awesome people. I mean, it, I had no I issue. Can't, I, can't, I can't say the same. Okay, well, the, same. the ones I ran across, now nah, it was from the parking lot to the press box and then back, but uh, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, there was too much red in that stadium, but Hunter, we appreciate well, you bringing the, the red into the, uh, into the chat here today. It was fantastic. We're going to go now to John Climac. Five. Thanks for the reports. Two weeks till we see what what kind of fight Marcus Freeman brings to the field. I'm sure it won't be a finished product, but I want to see more fights. John could not agree more. It'll be a really nice glimpse into what everyone's been excited about this offseason. Yeah. So thank you so much for the super chat. And I mean, I couldn't reiterate it more, Vince. I, I'm excited to just see what the product finally looks like. I feel like we have not had football know, right? for so long, you know? There's only so much we can get out of the practices that we see. And then when we get only get the first five periods, it's kind of the same stuff every time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see some actual football. And as Sean was saying, uh, Tommy Reese getting in the bag, which means he's being super creative with the offensive formations and things that's what's going to be on display on September 3rd at 7.30 or 8.30, whenever the game starts. That's what I'm excited to see. Absolutely. I know uh, David David Carpenter just put the double D. So it was a Loren, uh, Brayden Lindsay quote that meant developed and dominating. Ah. David, apologize. Next time we have Sean back, we will circle back with uh, – I'm sure we'll have him on before before the season starts. A super chat from Michael S. What's What about Maris Loifel? Not seen or heard much about him in practice sessions. Has he had an injury setback? So, Vince, I know we did not see him today because he was uh, no contact today, but you want to fill in a little bit about Maris Well, I'll tell you what, in all the practices that we've seen, all of the open practices that we've seen, he has not been starting. And I think the way things are trending, I mean, he didn't get a single rep today um, in, in team or seven on seven. And so... I would say if I was a betting man, and, and this is me talking, this is not any inside information or anything, but based on the way things are trending, I would say that, no, he's probably not going to start. But I would say that he's going to be an integral part off the bench. And we'll see what happens as far as what he can do, what he's cleared to do, all of those different things. I, look, if Notre Dame's going to beat Ohio State, they're going to need Maris Lufau. I, I, I truly believe that. Whether he's starting or not, that doesn't matter to me. I, that that I don't care. Uh, but yeah, it's as, as Brian said in the chat, we're still two weeks out. 
And so a lot of things can change between now and then. And frankly, this was our last open viewing. Mm-hmm. Why put him out there and let everybody see what he's doing? You know, I mean, you're going to have game prep coming up here in about a week. He'll be fine. He looked good to me on the sideline. Um, he's going to play. That, that's how I feel. I feel like he's going to play. I think you're going to need him uh, if you want to win. So I think it's going to happen. We have another super chat from Fred Stadelbar. I apologize if I completely butchered that. I do that from time to time. You guys rock. couple questions. One, timing for Love and Lions and Impemba commitments. Chances uh, they flip Ronan Hannafin and a top 200 quarterback. And number three is BD versus Singer, who throws for <laughs> Wow. All right. Is that what going to you guys and who throws further? Uh-huh. That's, that's the question. I, I'm gonna assume I'm gonna assume since Brian Driscoll is a former college quarterback, that I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that was a safe assumption that he could throw further. I, I think it's a very safe assumption, especially yes. well, I gotta be careful here. Uh, I, I will say that based on my personal experience, I will also agree that Brian Driscoll can throw the ball much further uh than our boy Singer. Um that's all. That's what I'll say. And there's there's Twitter pictures back from uh, December of 2019 that will back up my story. I'll just say that. Nice, nice. I'll, I'll say Brian can throw further with his left hand. Brian, we need that one back up. We didn't yeah, answer we the two, two questions. More parts. There we go. <laughs> Number one, timing for love and lions and an impenda commitment. So let's start with that one. So the Jeremiah Love commitments, we're going to – I'm going to put something on the board here kind of soon. So – We've been told by I've been told directly from Jeremiah's side that he wanted to have a commitment done this month. There's still some things that are getting worked out. Notre Dame is still, we believe, the leader in that in that uh, in that particular recruitment. But we will keep everyone updated as far as what the exact timeline is. He has not set a date, but as soon as we have a firm one, we will be able to, to put that out there for Mr. Lyons, Tayshawn Lyons, who is the wide receiver that was just um, just offered last week out of the state of California. They are going to get him on campus this fall, most likely for the Cal game, but that has not been cemented. So that getting him on campus is going to be a big step in this recruitment. If it goes well, I sh- I wouldn't picture it going too far after that, but it is definitely going to go into the fall, and he is definitely going to get at Notre Dame at some point. Just a question of which exact game he is going to be at. Samuel and Pemba. Similar deal. He's taking it into the fall. He is going to make a December decision. And we know Notre, he'll, he's going to visit Notre Dame this fall. So they save the official visit they have so he can come up to South Bend. We don't feel great about where Notre Dame is right now with this one. But the good thing about it is that you have several months to continue to recruit Samuel and Pemba, get him back on campus. But teams like Georgia, Miami, everyone's coming at him, right? And you know, there's factors and part of the recruitment that need to get ironed out and figured out, but Notre Dame has some time, but right now I would not call them near the leader in that one. I really wouldn't say there is a leader. I know some people have been saying Miami, Georgia, it's kind of all over the place depending on who you talk about. And that could change very quickly because there's still several months in that recruitment. Chances we flip Ronan Hannafin in a top 200 quarterback. The Ronan Hannafin thing, I think that he's very firm to Clemson. I, I don't know. I don't know what the process is going to be with him moving forward. If I'm being completely honest, I don't want to spitball and say, I'm sure they'll keep in contact, but I, I just, I don't know necessarily if he's a flippable type of kid. Cause it took it a long time to get to that decision. He's very well thought out. So is his family. They did their due diligence. So I, I, I don't know how realistic that one is top 200 quarterback. We'll see. There's a couple quarterbacks that, Notre Dame is talking to right now that I think would be in the close to top 200 quarterback status. So I still am a firm believer that Notre Dame is going to get a quarterback in this class. Now, the question is, who is it? There's a couple options on the board, but Fred, I do think there's a reasonable chance that Notre Dame could end up with the top 200 quarterback when it's all said and done. So that answers that. Boom. And thank you again for that super chat. We're going to go to another super chat. A lot of great super chats today. Thank great. you all so much. Man. I, from RCURN with Irish Luck, if Andrew K, Andrew Christophic, was solid last year with the past O-line coach, I have to think that he could be above average at his floor with Hot Watt and Harry Heastan. Vince, your thoughts on that? 100%. 100%. Like, there, there was there a drop-off between him and Jared Patterson? Yes. And that, that that's nothing against Andrew Christophic. 
That's just because Patterson's really, really good. Okay. He's the first man in at guard. I, I really do believe that. We didn't see – he was the only one that took number one reps uh, that I noticed today, and the line was still getting movement, getting push. I, look, Andrew Kostovic is going to be a really good guard. He'll probably start next year at guard uh, for Notre Dame at, from the start of the season. And so Andrew Kostovic is going to be a really, really good guard. It's just this year you've got Josh Lugg, who's a six-year senior, and you've got Jarrett Patterson, who's the number one center in the country, and they're just bumping him over to guard. He's just kind of the third man of a two-man battle, and, that, and it, it sucks for him. But mm-hmm. just based on this injury to Jared Patterson, he's got to be ready. And there's injury history with with uh, Josh Lugg, right? And so Andrew Kristoffic is going to have to be ready. He's going to play this year at some point. And I have no qualms about him playing. I think he's going to do a great job. Well, Vince, we talked about this the other day. I mean, the blessing in disguise for that mess that was the offensive line last year – a lot of guys played, yeah, right? Absolutely. So, like, they got a lot of experience, man. So, you created a lot of depth last year. And, again, did we want to see the offensive line in the state that it was last year? Absolutely not. But the fact of the matter is the fact that there were some injuries and some uneven play, you did get Andrew Christophic a lot of playing time. Michael Carmody played some football games. Z Carell played, even though it wasn't the best. So, like, we guys got the opportunity to play. Tosh Baker played a few football games. So, they created depth for themselves. So I, I think Andrew Kristoff is going to be fine. If he has to start against Ohio Absolutely. State and Jared Patterson isn't able to go, I'm not overly worried. Is it going to be quite as good as Jared Patterson? Of course not. But right. I, I still have confidence in Andrew Kristoff that he could play good, solid football. All right, we're going to move on to the next one from Tommy Guns. What's up, Tommy? Does Brandon Davis Swain have the same potential upside floor ceiling as Keon Keeley? Of course, Brandon Davis Swain is, is out of the state of Michigan in the 2024 class, the first recruits in the 2024 class for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. So, I, Tommy, for me, first we got to compare them as players, right? Keon Keeley was being recruited as a Viper that, like, maybe he'd be a strong side defensive end eventually. Who knows? But, you know, he's 6'6", 240-plus pounds. Brandon Davis Swain is more in the 6'4", 240-something pound frame. But if you see – if you look at his body – I could easily vision him being a strong side defensive end and maybe even an interior defensive lineman eventually, but definitely strong side defensive end, preferably compared to a Viper. I look, this is the truth that, you know, I I'm always going to come with you guys from the truth, right? Keon Keeley was the best recruit in the 2023 class. Right. In my opinion, no doubt. he still is. I think Brandon Davis Swain is an, excellent prospect and he's ranked as a top 50 recruit by i think one or two platforms and i think he has a lot of inside outside potential i think he's explosive i think he's powerful but he's not keon keely all due respect to him i think he's going to be a really good football player at notre dame though it's just i mean keon keely is in the top five ranked prospects pretty much across the board in the 2023 class for a reason could he get there could brandon davis swain make a type of jump sure he has the talent level like if you told me brandon davis swain was a top 25 player when it's all said and done, I would believe you. But again, I think that Keon Keeley has an argument for being the best player in his recruiting class. So it's just a little bit different in my opinion. Vince, I don't know if you've seen Brandon Davis Swain, but I just really, again, wanted to reiterate Keon Keeley is a special football player, obviously. I I, I, I don't really want to uh, get too far into the weeds because you pretty much covered it, but they're both really, really good football players, but Keon Keeley is at a different level. He just is. Mm-hmm. So and again, that's nothing against Brandon Davis Swain. He's just not Keon Keeley. Right. Okay. Right. It, it's, yeah, it, it's, I mean, <laughs> when, when you have a guy like a Keon Keeley, it, it's almost like saying the Viper in 2023 for Notre Dame. Oh, he's not quite as good as I faith as a Foskey. Okay. <laughs> like, that's right. a great football player. I mean, right. it doesn't mean you still can't be a really good and impactful football player just because you aren't quite as good as, as a certain player. I mean, it just is what it is. Exactly. So, yeah, no doubt. But Tommy, about it's that. a great question. It I'm is. excited about Brandon Davis Swain. I'm excited about the 2024 class as well as the 2023 class still. So appreciate the question, though, Tommy, as always. We're going to move on to Christopher Crosby. There was a lot of coaching changes this year. Outside of Notre Dame, who is a player you expect to excel under their new coaching staff? This is a weird one. Uh, unless she's a fun one, I meant to say. Not weird, Christopher. I don't know why I said weird. Mine is <laughs> Justin Flo in Oregon with Dan Lanning. Christopher, that's an interesting one. And Vince, I'll give you a second if, if like, oh, one pops in your head. But all you, buddy. Okay, so Justin Flo 
has only played in, I think, two football games in his career at Oregon. He only played in one last season, but that one game he played, he had 14 tackles and two tackles for loss. He's an incredibly athletic and explosive linebacker. I hope, Christopher, to your point, that Justin Flo is able to stay healthy. If he is, he's a really talented football player, and I agree that he could excel with Dan Lanning next to a guy like a Noah Sewell. But that's a good one. I So a coaching change that they think is going to kind of open things up. So one, one player that I am thinking of is, okay, perfect one. Ready? So I was just actually talking to someone earlier today about a, a Miami, uh, Zion Nelson, that starts left tackle for the University of Miami. So quick backstory on him. He was a former high school tight end, came to the University of Miami, was only 240 pounds, bulked up and was a starting left tackle as a freshman at like 260, 270 pounds and should not have been starting for Miami at left tackle when he was a freshman. But he took his lumps in his game against game against Florida that year. And now we're sitting here three years later and he's been better at left tackle over the last two years. He's now 6'5", 316 pounds with 35-inch arms. He's a legit NFL draft prospect, but it still hasn't been perfect. He's been better, though. It's linearly, there's been progression for Zion Nelson. But I'm excited about Mario Cristobal coming in because not as not only is Mario Cristobal an offensive line guy, they also have Alex Mirabel coming over from Oregon as well, who's the offensive line coach that was with the Penne Souls of the world and made some really good Oregon offensive lines. So I'm excited about Zion Nelson, hopefully having some better coaching offensive line wise. So that one's a little bit off the wall, but Christopher, I do like your pick. I really don't even think it's, I don't even think it's Dan Lanning's creation though with Justin Flo just needs to stay healthy, man. Like he just hasn't been healthy. So we'll see, but it's a, it's a really good question. So Vince, we have one, looks like a little safety talk here. Corey D says, it appears DJ Brown We'll start with Brandon Joseph. Huh? We, we didn't talk about that. Does DJ Brown as a starter worry you? It worries me. So Vince, you talked about it. Houston Griffith was taking rest with the one. We see Ramon Henderson. Uh, Corey seems to think that DJ Brown may start. So your thoughts just on DJ Brown as a player and potential starter if he does get that nod. Yeah, well, I would have said before going into today that that DJ Brown was probably going to be the starter. I mean, that's what it looked like based on the reps we were seeing and, and things of that nature. As far as being worried about it, I mean, look, I don't root for certain kids, um, you know, that I don't, I don't know these kids well enough to root for anybody or, or whatever. I assumed, to be honest with you, that Ramon Henderson was going to be the guy that was going to get the start. And he's been running with the second team pretty consistently. Um, there's been a bit of a rotation with the first team between Houston Griffith and DJ Brown. I think all four of those guys are going to play, though. You know, Joseph Brown, uh, Griffith and uh and Henderson, I, I think all four of them are going to play. You know, DJ Brown, he hits hard. His tackling has been an issue in the past. I get that. Uh, he's not the most athletic guy in the world, but he's always in the right place at the right time, which when you're a coach, it's something that you really like to have, okay? And, and there's not really a whole lot of substitute for having a guy in the right place at the right time, even if he's just slowing a guy up and allowing the rest of the guys to, to rally to the football, you know, that kind of a thing. So I don't really have an issue with DJ Brown. He won the spot. If he's the starter, then he won the spot. Uh, I was hoping that maybe some other guys might surpass him, but if he won the spot and he's better than the other guys, then he's the one that deserves to start. Yeah. Yep, we'll see how it kind of works out. Again, there's a few good options. Oh, look who it is. Come to save the day. Brian Driscoll joined the show. Brian, we weren't doing a good enough job, apparently. Huh? No, 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 no. Don't even, don't even try that. Uh, Vince and I are both battling a little uh, little uh, issue today. So uh, Vince is cold. going to take on half. Little, He's got a little head cold. I have a, a migraine uh, that has made it hard to see straight today. But you know what I always say, Vince? Rule number 76. Rule number 76. No excuses. Play like a champion. So I am back. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's start out here. We're excited to have Brian on the show with us, as always. Tyler Smith with the Super Chat. How is James Laurinaitis doing? Being from Ohio and watched him play, was was wondering how he's doing with the boys. Go Irish, beat Ohio State. Right. From everything, I mean, look, we see him at practice, and he's coaching up guys and everything, and he's very active and energetic from what my guys tell me. You know, but the thing is, Ryan, he's still kind of getting used to being a coach, right? So there's going to be some of that, but he's got the energy. He knows the game. 
Uh, and from what I've been told so far, the players really gravitate to him. So, and the other thing too is James Laronitis' ability to be effective is going to have a lot to do with, with Al Golden. And what I mean by that is not every defensive coordinator, especially a veteran defensive coordinator, someone that's accomplished what Al Golden has accomplished, is going to necessarily want to allow a young, unproven guy, no matter his NFL and college experience, to just come in and take over the position group at times. Well, he's done that with James Laronitis from every from from the guys that have been at practice that I've talked to, like my guys that have been at practice, you know, from other people that have been around that are around the team that you know that he's given James Laronitis a voice, and that's important. And it may seem like a no brainer, but anyone that's been in this business, Ryan knows egos a lot of times make people make bad decisions. And from everything I have been told, Al Golden Al Golden has embraced James Laronitis and and looks at him as an asset, not as anything other than than that. I mean, a guy that, hey, look, I got a 10-plus year NFL veteran who was one of the, the greatest linebackers of the last 30 years in college, right? Mm -hmm. Why would I not want to take advantage of that in my room? And he's done that, and I think that's uh, helped. And he's going to get better and better and better as he gets more and more comfortable with, number one, teaching, and then number mm -hmm. two, teaching to a level that's more receptive to college players as opposed to, you know, the language he's been speaking the last however many years, which is an NFL language, which is different than college. I mean, it's a more advanced language, right? It's the difference between like, you know, Spanish 101 and then you're in like your master's level classes of Spanish, right? Or, you know, whatever language you want to choose. So that's, uh, you know, but so far so good. Mm -hmm. Rams all-time leading tackler, James Laurinaitis, as I like to call him. Yeah, that's, We're that's move decent, on. right? It's decent. It's decent. It's Rams have had some good Sorry. linebackers over I mean, the years. Yeah, he was he wasn't on the best Rams teams of all time, but you know he he did his yeah. job. Obviously, we're going it's not to his fault. Uh, B it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, not his, his fault. fault. You're you're not wrong about that. We're going to Brian BK PTSD victim. I don't know, that's a great name. Not sure if you guys have talked about this yet, but what were your thoughts on the Manti Teo documentary? Have well, you Ryan, seen it, I haven't Brian? seen it. I haven't seen it yet. So you this is all it. you. Okay. Yeah. So me and my wife watched it two days ago. So. Wednesday night. I really enjoyed it for the simple fact of it's, I think that it did a great job. It was unfair from the beginning. If we're being completely honest, right? I mean, a guy got catfish and he got deceived and people tried to paint him out to being the bad guy. That's what happened with Manti Teo. And this documentary unveiled the truth behind everything. And I think most people understood that like, it wasn't Manti's fault, right? Like that's, it's, it literally happens. There's a show on MTV called catfish. Like this stuff happens and it's a very unfortunate circumstance. And it's even more unfortunate because the person that tried to act like the victim and at the end of the day also did it right around when his grandmother passed away, which is just like, that's such a sick thing, man. Like it was just really, really horrible that that happened to Manti. And it really, I mean, it really tarnished what he did as far from a, from a national perception, you know, it, cause I Notre Dame fans, I think still appreciate the greatness that was Manti Teo in the season that he had in 2012. Do we talk the, about the him enough though? That That's the thing, right? Probably, like Sean, well, from a Sean, national perspective, yeah. no, from well, a well, national I'm talking perspective, about Notre Dame. Not. I'm talking even Notre Dame. Fans. So Sean Stiers and I were talking about this last night. Cause Sean, Sean, actually, yeah. they did a whole show on it last night. So if you, mm -hmm. if you don't watch the IB nation sports, uh, sports talk show, which is at six o'clock every night, uh, on Monday to Thursday, you, you're missing out because they talked about this last night, Ryan. And that was the conversation that – because Sean had asked if I'd seen it, and I told him I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I, I want to, but I haven't had a chance to do it yet. And what, what Sean and I were talking about is Sh Manti Teo was the most decorated linebacker in the history of college football. Not, not just Notre Dame, but the history of college football. You're talking about a guy that was a Heisman runner-up, won every award manageable. I mean, or, I mean, possible that he could, he could win. I'm, I'm going to pull up – his resume from his from his senior season, he won the Maxwell Award, which is not a linebacker or defensive. That's the best player in college football. He won the Lott Trophy. He won the Ch Chuck Bednarik Award. He won the Walter Camp Award, which again is for the best player in the country, regardless of position. You know, he won the Nagurski Award. He won the Butkiss Award. He won the Lombardi Award. He was a unanimous All-American. And he won, uh, and he and he was a, a excuse me runner up to the Heisman. And to put that into perspective, here who has won? Here's who's won the Walter Camp Award since since Manti won it: Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota, Derrick Henry, Lamar Jackson, Baker Mayfield, Tua Tungavaloa, Joe Burrow, Devontae Smith, Kenneth Walker Jr. 
quarterbacks, a couple running backs, and a wide receiver. And a lot of those dudes won the Heisman Trophy. Manti won that award in 2012. And so, and same thing with the Maxwell Award. I mean, if you look at who's won the Maxwell Award since then, it's A.J. McCarron in 2013, which is a little shaky, Marcus Mariota, Derrick Henry, Lamar Jackson, Baker Mayfield, Tua Tungvaloa, uh, Joe Burrow, Devontae Smith, and Bryce Young. All right, so th- these are not awards handed out to linebackers very often. And Manti won both of those awards. Matter of fact, I'm trying to kind of go back and find when the last time a linebacker won that award, and I'm now in the 80s, and I still haven't found it yet. So I'm going to go ahead and stop looking. Uh, and I'm now in the – I mean, I guess you could maybe count Hugh Green as an outside linebacker who won it 1980, Ryan, you know, in, in the th- – in in so, I, I, w- I wouldn't count at, him. As a defense at, best, <laughs> at best, at yeah. best, 1980, at best, uh-huh. since a, a linebacker won that kind of award. And and we don't talk about him the way that we should as Notre Dame fans, I, to be honest with you, because it's kind of like it, – it's a touchy subject, right, with everything that happened. But – it's just it's it's sad that that Manti doesn't get the love that he gets, and again I don't mm-hmm. I don't know what the document. I mean you you've told me some things and Sean Styers has yeah. told me some things and other people have told me some things about it, but the reality mm-hmm. is this is one of the greatest players of this generation, and and he wasn't just good as a senior. I mean you and I were talking about this the other day. His numbers even before that were even better. I mean, you know, he he the, the seven interceptions in 2012 were really impressive, right? I mean, those those were those were really impressive numbers. But you know, in that in that season, Manti had 113 tackles. He had five and a half tackles for loss and one and a half sacks. But he had seven picks, which was huge. And he was a great player even beyond the production. But in 2011, he had 128 tackles, 13 and a half tackles for loss and five linebackers or five sacks. In 2010, he had 129 tackles and eight and a half tackles for loss. And then as a true freshman, he had 63 tackles and five and a half t- tackles for loss. I mean, this is a kid that was an inc- incredibly productive player with, I-, I believe he had over 400 career tackles, if I'm doing the math on that correctly. So, and, and we and we just don't hear about him. And whenever his name is brought up, it's like as a joke, oh, you know, yeah. Manti Teo's girlfriend and all this other kind of stuff. 437 career tackles. Manti Teo had 437 career tackles most decorated linebacker in history. And, and we just don't talk about him enough. And it's because of the uneasiness of when you mention his name, it, it, it isn't just about what he did as a football player. It always has that associated with it. And that's sure. kind of heartbreaking to be completely honest with you. It really yeah. is. And, and, and without, again, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I want people to go watch the documentary. Cause I really did think it was really well done, very informative But I'm happy that I think a lot of people got the full scope of the situation from a national perspective. Because now I think, and honestly, this is going to sound dumb because like a lot of people don't know him personally. But like a lot of people owe him a a a apology. Like they they truly do because there were a lot of vulgar and disgusting jokes and quotes, and it's just it was just not great for Manti. Yeah. So here's what I hope. Here's what I'm really, 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 really hoping happens. I want to see Notre Dame act quickly to get Manti back on campus in a public forum. I would yeah. love to see Manti back at a game, Manti back in some capacity where, because he's been back to games, but he's never been promoted as Manti's back. And right. I think part of it, I, this is my guess, my opinion. This is not something I know, but it, 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 I do believe it, it. part of it is because of all of that. You know, all, all of the stuff that's associated with it. I hope that now that this documentary is out and Manti has finally had a chance to kind of speak, you know, truth into the situation that yeah. Notre Dame then follows up and says, hey, we got your back. You know what I mean? Let's right. let's get you back in front of the Notre Dame Nation people. And 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 I think the environment's changed a lot since then. You know, like I was talking to Sean Styers, like, you know, my wife and I met <clears throat> online. And, and that's not something I tell a lot of people because I mean, we were, I told him we were four years in the marriage when Manti's thing happened. And I would always Mm -hmm. tell people, how'd you meet your wife? Well, I was at a youth pastor's convention and she was at a firefighters conference. What I don't tell people is we were in different cities and we met (laughs) on a, on a, on a Christian organization, a Christian website that was like not necessarily a dating website, but, you know, we were friends for a while before we ever kind of took that next step. And, and so, but I have always been uncomfortable kind of sharing that for a long time. Not so much anymore. I mean, I've been married 14 years. I'm pretty happy it's worked out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But 
I mean, even then, I was married four years to a woman that I had met online, and I was uncomfortable saying, hey, I met her online. It was just such a different mm -hmm. environment now, where now it's like people do that all the time. And so I think it's a more... Over 40% over, over of relationships today are online relationships. That's crazy. So, That's yes, crazy. Yeah. Yep. But yep. so I, I think it'd be a more welcoming environment and people are more understanding as of, of, you know, how you could kind of, it, it, you know, get duped into the situation like that. So anyway, I, I would 100%. love to see Manti. I would love to see Notre Dame follow up by getting Manti back on campus. And yeah. as Michael S says, Manti should be celebrated at Notre Dame. And, and that's what 100%. I'm saying, Michael. I hundred. And now here's the thing though. It, it's perfect timing for Notre Dame because now is the 10 year anniversary of that 2012 season. It's now the yeah. 10 year anniversary of Manti having the greatest individual season from a from an awards and a recognition standpoint of a linebacker in my lifetime, and I'm in my 40s. So mm -hmm. now is the perfect time, really, for Notre Dame to do this. They need to do this, and and Notre Dame is usually does a pretty good job of taking care of their own in situations like this, and they need to step up. You got a former linebacker as the head football coach, right? They need to step mm -hmm. up and do something where Manti is honored you know, before one of these games, you know, bring him back as an honorary captain or, you know, something like that where, <clears throat> you know, where you can give him the due that he deserves for just, you know, just how brilliant of a player he was and, and he was a captain and all those kind of things. So I would uh, – and look, he was a big part. of What happens if 2012 – where is Notre Dame right now if 2012 doesn't happen? There's a lot of people mm -hmm. not happy with the first two years of the Brian Kelly tenure, especially 2011. And, mm -hmm. you know, the next couple of years weren't great either. You know, what happens if Brian Kelly doesn't have that 2012 season? Well, that 2012 season was about Manti. And now he was not alone. It was another other great players, a part of that team. But Manti was the driving. He was the heart and soul of that football team. And mm -hmm. um, I would just love to see him back. And Because I, I think now this documentary's out. I don't know if you think this, Ryan. I feel like the reception mm -hmm. would even be more welcoming from Notre Dame fans if Manti oh, was 100%. Back. I think it would be more welcoming from everyone. I, I think the the worst the worst part of the whole thing, Brian, was seeing how Manti had to get through some. I mean, like we're talking about. I mean, again, if you haven't seen the documentary, I'm not going to say too much, but I mean, he had to go through therapy and just mm -hmm. you know the mental anguish of everything that was going on, and it was very very unfortunate. And I agree to someone in the chat that said the uh, here right here the. BB, BBG should be coached, said those two dead spin reporters are awful people. Yes, if you haven't seen the documentary, I won't say more than that. But yes, those were people were awful, awful people. There's no doubt about that. So moving on, though, and I agree with you. Everyone celebrate Manti Teo, greatest Notre Dame player of my my lifetime. Sure, certainly margin. most decorated, no question yes. about it. Yep. yep. So let's move on to Blaine Tiller. What does the IB team think of the new broadcasters for the home games this year? And how do you think they compare to previous years? Brian, we haven't talked about this, obviously. Jack Collingsworth and Jason Garrett are the, the two announcers. Game day, of course, recently, only a few days ago, was announced. I will say I am very – I'm very yeah. – uh, yeah, eh. I'm, I, I, it, it's it's like I'm indifferent, sort of, but like also more disappointed than just indifferent. Like it's just sure. like wow, that that was that that's what we're doing, getting. Huh? I mean, it's, yeah, I've listened to Jason Garrett, and I'm just like, no, I'm okay. I don't I don't need to listen to Jason right. Garrett talk. But yeah, you know. it's just another example of of NBC treats Notre Dame like it's the minor leagues. It's it's where they it's where they put guys to kind of work on things or guys that they just have around and. You know, they did it with Drew Brees, you know, his experiment last year. Now they're experimenting with Jay, with, with Jason Garrett. And and I don't know, maybe he'll do a great job. I, I have no clue. I've never listened to Jason Garrett as an, an as an has he ever done this before? Has he been a play by play guy? Has he done studio analysis before? I have no idea. He he has, but, yeah. He did he did he did some anal analyst stuff last yeah. year. And I was I, I was not I was not partial to it. Just I'm just thinking like his personality would have to change a little bit from when he was a coach. And some really dry press conferences for me to be too thrilled about this. And look, I, I know a lot of Notre Dame people are fired up about Jack Collinsworth being the play-by-play -play guy. And I get that because he is a Notre Dame graduate. I mean, he he mm -hmm. went to Notre Dame. His brother Austin played for Notre Dame in, in the BK tenure. But I just kind of feel like this is Notre Dame. Like, he's a up-and-comer, I guess. I've never been a, a huge fan of Jack's work. I mean, it's not bad. I don't I'm not trying to disrespect Jackie. I don't know him. I've never met him. I, I have no ill will. I'm, 
I'm not one of those people that's going to say, oh, it's because of who his dad is or whatever. I mean, right. You know, because like I grew up listening to his dad do Notre Dame games. His dad used to be a color guy for Notre Dame back in the 90s. So I, I got no problem was, there. But was he, was he more was he more tolerable than he is now? I hope no, then he was not really. No. And, he, and, he, and he would always kind of look for a chance to kind of, you know, it seemed like to, and, and that's more of an NBC thing, you know, praise the other team. But that's more of an NBC thing. NBC's always been that way. So. But at the time, I didn't, you know, it was, it was still kind of early in the NBC contract. It just kind of, I took it like, man, why is this guy rooting against Notre Dame? And I was younger then, you know, I didn't quite get it like I get it now. I would have a different reaction to it now as a 44-year-old who now understands what NBC's goal is. And I think it's a silly goal, but his job isn't to change it. His job is to do his job, right? And that's what they wanted. And, you know, and I, I was, the reason I remember is because I was watching the game the other day. I think it's the 92 BC game. I think Collinsworth was doing the, the, the color for that. I think that was the game that it was. There was one of the games I watched recently. You know, but Jack's okay, but it's just kind of like, that's the best that you can do. Like, you don't have another, like, top level, you know, college football play by play guy that can do that. I just, you know, it just seems a little, um, I don't know. Seems a little strange to me, but um, I mean, that's kind of what NBC does. Like, honestly, you know who I would have liked yeah. to have seen do it is the radio team, Paul Burmeister and sure. Ryan Harris. I'd have been much yeah, happier I'd with that. I, I love Paul and Ryan. Ryan, I think is pretty good too. So yeah, I'd, I'd be. Totally Ryan brings a lot of energy. Like, He's knowledgeable. Like, yeah. The only thing with Ryan, from you know, I've gone back and you know, talked to some people and things like that. I think the only thing with him is because he's he's really smart. When he gets mm-hmm. fired up, he starts kind of maybe talking over people a little bit, meaning because he, he gets out. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, which for me, I would love, you know, but that's yeah, something. Same. I mean, Ryan's still kind of young, new at this, right? I mean, that's something that evolves and gets better. But the couple times I've listened to him on the radio, he's got a lot of passion. You know, he's knowledgeable of the game. He can talk about the game. He clearly loves Notre Dame. I mean, he he doesn't live around here. He literally will fly out to Denver, the day, back out to yeah. Denver the day after a game to go do a show he does in Denver. That's how much he wants to be a part of this Notre I, Dame I've, thing. I've been on the radio with Ryan before. Like he brought, they brought me on as an NFL draft guest and I know he does all that stuff out in Denver too. Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. crazy, man. He's, I mean, he's good though. He's smart. He's, he's really very, smart. Yeah. And I think Paul Burmeister does a great job on play by play. I think he does 100%. a great job. So that's what I would have liked to see. But, you know, Jack is a guy that they're, you know, is an up and comer that they're trying to raise up and giving him the Notre Dame gig is a, is a, profile and I, I think in nbc's weird way this is them throwing a bone to notre dame people by finally putting a notre dame person in the booth but it's like that's not the that's not the, that's move, not the bro. guy that wanted <laughs> that's the move, right, bro. right i i will yeah. i will give it an open mind i just i had i do have preconceived notions about jason garrett i'll yeah. be very honest about it yeah so. no i well and you're you're uh yeah. and you're well you're not an eagles fan that's i keep forgetting your wife's an eagles not, fan i keep not, forgetting not, i keep forgetting no no it's uh let's go to this one yeah. ryan sure let's do it Blaine Tiller asks, which quarterback worries you more against Notre Dame this year, Phil Dracovic or Caleb Williams? Brian, you have a, you have a quick answer on this one, Phil Dracovic or Caleb Williams? Well, which one worries me the most? I mean, to me, it's it's as an individual quarterback, it's Phil Dracovic. I mean, I think individually the big guy that can bounce off sacks, that you know, that can can make those kind of plays. He's going to be coming into that game with a little bit of extra motivation when, you know, you consider, yeah. you know, the his story and just kind of where he came from and those type of things. But I think he's the better overall playmaker. I think that the thing about CJ is CJ is playing in an offense where the talent around him is going to be a little better from the skill positions. You know, Phil's got a couple really good – he's got a really good receiver, a really good yes. running back, a, a, we think a good tight end and in, in George Takis. Jalen Gill's a nice player, but not an elite player. Whereas sure. at, at USC, I, you, know, you and I were talking about this yesterday. I think Jordan Addison's a little overrated from the standpoint of I don't think he's the best receiver in college football. He's pretty good, though. He's a good player. You he's know, player, he's yeah. a pretty good player, though. And he's definitely top five to seven at the very least, right? So, I mean, the overrated tag is not like I think he stinks and all. You know, He's just not the best, and there's guys I'd take over him. I'd be more worried about defending Xavier Worthy, for example, than I would Jordan Addison. It, but it's not just Jordan Addison. It's Mario Williams. It's Brendan Rice. It's Terrell Bynum. It's you know, it's it's a group of players that you got to worry about. It's Travis Dye out of the backfield. So I think yeah. the offense that USC is going to have worries me a little bit more from a skill player standpoint. But just the individual quarterback, uh, Phil would be the one that I would be more concerned with, just because he can run, he can throw down the field. You can have him queued up and hit him, and it just doesn't matter. He's going to bounce off of it and. You know, go back and watch the game they played against BC two years ago. If it's not for Phil Dracovic, that that's a 40-point game. 
I mean, he Great. made some insane plays in that game. Remember the one where he's like rolling left and he just throws like a 50-yard rope and the safety thinks he's got it and all of a sudden it goes over his head to a guy like 20 yards behind him? I mean, it he was, made some bombs. There is a weird, weird little notion on Twitter sometimes that Phil Dracovic doesn't have a strong arm and I'm just like, do you want me to show you that play where he's rolling to his left and right. just throws that bazooka to the it side? Is weird. Like, it is Some of that stuff is weird. Like if It's like, did you only watch him late in the year last year? Like when he was I, I playing think, with a broken hand? Like I don't understand I, that one. I think it's because even like pretty traditionally, Phil doesn't throw a tight ball, right? Like the spiral, he doesn't always throw with a tight spiral. So I think that makes people think that he doesn't have a strong arm. I really think that's what right. it is, but like that doesn't mean that. That's just yeah. that's just whatever, whatever. Yeah, it's weird. It's very Twitter's weird. Twitter's stupid, right, Brian? It really, I, you know it. You see, so you're finally coming around. <laughs> I know there's sarcasm in there, but I'm owning. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. However, I can get it. So here's well, here's I, another I, one I've, to blame. I've, I've never disagreed that Twitter was stupid, but for yeah. Bade Tiller. You which view Notre it as Dame a necessary evil. I understand. Yes. Oh, 100%. Which Notre Dame quarterback since 2000 would you have wanted to have had a change to coach, to their coach? Would have That's had a chance to one. coach. Which oh, QB, have chan- yeah. oh, I can't read. I can't read. Okay. Yeah, would have had okay. a chance to coach. So which quarterback since 2000 would you have wanted to have a chance to coach? I mean, he's already coaching. Tommy Reese, I thought, always right. just struck me as a quarter, as a coach, you know, like yeah. an offensive coordinator. Maybe we'll see what happens eventually. Another guy that that's, I think that's my answer. I, it's lame because it's already reality, Brian. But like, I mean, Brady Quinn could probably fire up the troops. But like, I, I've never looked yeah. at him and been like offensive coordinator ish type of guy. Like Tommy Reese was that guy. Like from the moment I saw Tommy Reese. I was like, that guy is going to be a great coach because he's competitive and he's smart. Like those two things are going to make him a good coach someday. That was my guy. I'm going to take this a different direction. I'm going to read this as which one would I have wanted to have a chance to coach. Mm-hmm. And, and and for me, it would have been Jimmy Clausen. And the reason for that is, is because I would have loved – Jimmy Clausen or Deshaun Kaiser is who the two guys I would have loved to have coached in Notre Dame. And the reason why is I would have put my foot up their behinds <laughs> Not let them get away with that prima donna stuff. Told their dads to go take a freaking hike and got the most out of them, right? Because yeah. if Jimmy Clausen would have had somebody that would have – like Charlie Weiss didn't do that. Charlie kind of let Jimmy be Jimmy, and I think it hurt him. Because not only did Jimmy have his own personality issues, but then he was kind of lifted up on this pedestal, and that made it even harder to like him. I would not have done that, and I think that would have made Jimmy such a better player and and a more liked and respected player. And the same thing with Deshaun Kaiser. You know, I, I've talked, I've had this conversation with someone when, when the turnover happened, when the changeover happened after 2016. There's a couple coaches like, man, we wish that Deshaun would have come back because we wouldn't have treated him that way. You know, we we would have we would have gotten the most out of him because we wouldn't have let him act that way. You know, maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't have, but the reality is, um, you know, to me. I would have loved to have coached Jimmy Clausen because I would have taken a whole different approach on him. No question. I just realized that I I read this question wrong twice. So to answer the question the way it was actually intended to be answered, (laughs) my answer would actually be Brandon Wimbush because I would not. I would have let him. That's a good point. He was and not really try to change him. Like Brandon, be who you are, brother. I am not going to make you do something that you're not comfortable with being. You be you. That's where I would go. Yeah. I would say Brandon Wimbush because I really do think that the coach is just mentally just fried him, man. Like yeah, he was just, it that's was, a it was really good one. That's a really yeah. good one, Ryan. Really good one. Yeah, yeah. Let's when when I can read, I make a good point occasionally. So yeah, it's all know. good. It's all good. You're used to me doing it. It's all good. I put you in a tough spot today, but you know what? You're stepping up to the plate and getting it done. It's all good, buddy. It. Here's here's a good one. I'll, I'm going to read this one, Ryan, because this is going to be yep. more for you. Uh, okay. Brandon Plensner says, B. Ryan, who are a couple of Viper prospects in the 23 cycle that you'd personally like to see Notre Dame go after? I'm curious to see. There's a couple that I really like, Ryan, and I'm curious to see if you if you mention them. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to mostly stick with the guys that are on the Notre Dame board, Brandon. I know we've seen a couple, a couple offers that have come out. Caleb Herring's one, of course, out of Tennessee. I know we've talked a lot about Blake Purchase out of the state of Colorado. He's a little bit of a smaller version of a Viper. And then we just saw um, Jaden Moore, excuse me, out of California be a recent offer. I really like the offer to to Herring. And personally, Brian, I really like both defensive ends that are committed to Tennessee right now. So I would Mm -hmm. be recruiting my tail off for either Caleb Herring or Chandavian Bradley. I think both of them have 
big time upside, man. Like both incredibly long. Bradley's like 6'4", 6'5", but he's got vines and he is explosive. He's also a notable basketball player. Caleb Herring is, I have no idea why it's 6'6", 220. They're like, we're going to play you as an overhang defender. But like yeah. the kid can move, man. So I would be targeting both those Tennessee kids, I think. Like that would be my, the, the, that the, they, I like Blake Purchase. I like Jaden Moore a little bit from just a talent perspective, but those two, they're not needle they're movers. Dudes. No, yeah, they, they not, fit a not, role, not but they're not needle not movers. to those kids. Mm-hmm. Absolutely no. not. Yeah. There's a couple that you, uh, Caleb Herring and Shindavian Bradley are definitely two on my board and, and they're two guys with offers. So, you know, it would make sense. Another guy that has an offer that I would make a run at is Colton Vasek. I think he could be a That's Viper a in, in, in a similar tradition to key. I mean, he's not as good as Keon Keeley, not close, but he plays a very similar game and has a very similar skill set, just not as explosive and dynamic as Keon's is, you know, 6'5", mm-hmm. 230, you know, really athletic kid, just not, I mean, very similar players. Keon's just a better version of it, you know, sure. committed to Oklahoma and he's a teammate of Jaden Greathouse, right? So you'd, you'd have a guy in his ear all the time if you chose to do that. And then maybe if Oklahoma doesn't like you, say, okay, you back off Peyton Bone and we'll back off Colton Vasek, right? Right. Um, hey, that's a, good, that's a fair uh, trade, honestly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a kid from Oklahoma committed to Michigan State named By Job. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, maybe it's Joby. He's a really good player. He, he's, he might be more of a tr- big end in the Notre Dame defense, but I think he's really twitchy, and I think he can really play on the in, in a Viper in a traditional defensive end role. I wouldn't necessarily be dropping him into coverage a lot. But he's a guy. And then the other one is there's a kid from, I don't know if you've seen him, but I believe he's from Utah. His name is Tecelia Kana. I ranked him number 75 overall in my top 100. He's about a 6'3, 6'4, 215, 220 pound kid. That is the a prototype Viper in, in the, the way that Notre Dame used it last year. He can rush the edge. He's got some power. He's really athletic and smooth. He can drop in a coverage. You know, he can get up underneath the curl. He can buzz the flats. He can do some of those things you want that all-around Viper to do. He's uncommitted. Oklahoma's considered a, a strong leader for him from what I've read, but Oklahoma's already got a couple defensive ends. They yeah. may actually be recruiting him as a linebacker if I'm if I'm you know if I'd have to guess, but he's definitely a guy that I would go after as well just to kick the tires because there's going to be one of these top kids that's really talented that you're going to look at and be like, okay, this kid, this kid likes us, right? And just I'd kick the tires on a bunch of them. I mean, you got what it we're August 19th. So you've basically got four, what, four months before signing mm-hmm. day almost. I'd kick the tires on a lot of those kids. And then if you go out and have the kind of season you think you're going to have, and Keon, or not Keon Keeley, goodness gracious, Isaiah Foskey <laughs> does what you think he's going to do as a player, then you yeah. got something great to sell. So that's what I would do. I, I mean, I wouldn't be afraid to go after some of those committed kids and then some of those top ranked kids that people think are going other places. I, I'd be all over. I've heard people talk about like Tamorian Parker, who decommitted from Penn State from Alabama. He commit decommitted from Penn State because he's looking to stay in the South. I don't think that one would work. And he's a big end. Tamori Parker's yeah. a big end. He he he's not a guy that I would look at for that open role. And and I don't I think that would be kind of a waste of resources to be honest with you. Because most kids that decommit like that have an idea of the schools they're going to consider. It's like Keon, mm-hmm. for example. I mean, he has already got two visits set up to Ohio State and 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 uh, Alabama. I've heard that he may may go visit Florida. Like, there's already a list of schools that he's going to consider. Some may jump in, but he didn't decommit just opening it back up wide totally open it up. to everybody, yes. right? Like he, there's a list of schools that he likes. I, That's usually I, I how really, it goes, Ryan. I, I was about to say, I, I don't like the, I'm opening up my recruitment. No, you're, you're just decommitting and you have a few right. schools that you're talking to. Like, right. that's what it is. So like right. opening up makes it sound like I'm open to anything. Yeah. No, no, wide that's, open that's again. No. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, you're so. more receptive to others, but you know, sure. we'll, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. I, I like, I like the Colton Vasic one though, because he, I mean, he's already proven because he's got the Texas ties. His dad went to Texas. He's already proven once that like he'll go away from the tradition right. there in Texas, right. right? But I mean, he is long and he's got really good hands, man. And he, I mean, he's got a body where he could hold probably another 40, 50 pounds when mm-hmm. it's all said and done. He's a really, yeah. really interesting football player. Really interesting. Here, here's one for you, Ryan. This is a good one from Archer two four five two. If you could attend any regular season game this year that doesn't involve Notre Dame, which would it be and why? 
See, I, I think that I think most people would probably look at like the Texas Alabama game or like one of those big games that we've kind of been highlighting a little bit. But I think I would want to go to like a, a, a really big tradition game that I haven't been to. Right. Like I think about like the Iron Bowl with Auburn, Alabama. I've never been there. It's, it seems incredible. I, I want to kind of experience that. Ohio State, Michigan would be another one I would like to just see because of the atmosphere. So I would probably go with one of those really big tradition games. I, I would say the Iron Bowl just for like the Alabama Auburn because those games, no matter how bad or how good Auburn is, or vice versa, it always seems to be a really good game. Like Auburn stunk last year, and Alabama was probably the best team in the country at that time because yeah. they had some injuries, and, and Alabama or Auburn outplayed them for fifty nine minutes. I mean, it, yes. it, it, they really did. I think the I, I'm with you. I like the traditional games, but there's some that I don't really care to see this year. Like I don't really care about the Georgia Florida game this year because I just don't think Florida will be necessarily overly competitive. Yeah, you know, I think a game that I, I would I'm, I would like to see is uh, this year that's going to be very interesting is the Red River Shootout, which is it's the Red River Shootout. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, that's a game I'd like to see. I, I've always wanted to kind of go there. You know, I think that'd be a fun game to go to. And then this year in particular, though, would be a great year to see the Ohio State Michigan game because oh, yeah, that that I mean, <laughs> with Michigan beating them last year, and it's like yeah. it, you know, and I think Michigan will you know be an eight nine win team at least by then. Because of their schedule, uh, that's going to be a wild game. That's going to be a great. I mean, because I've watched that game. There's no individual game I've watched more other than Notre Dame Navy, Notre Dame USC. There's no game I've watched more in my life than Michigan Ohio State because I grew up in Ohio. That's just kind of what we did on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Is you know that at noon we'd watch Ohio State Michigan and then watch the Notre Dame game later. And, and so that's one that I wouldn't mind going to see. But in, in normally, like, I would love to see USC, UCLA, and the Rose Bowl. I would love yeah, to watch one. that. I don't know if this is the year I'd want to see it. Uh, I well, wish I didn't have to go to California to see it. There you go. That's what I'm saying. I wish I didn't have to go to California to watch it. Uh, yeah. You know, but uh, maybe I could just, like, like parachute in and then just have me helicoptered out so I only ever touch the part of California in the stadium. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't see that happening, so. Unless I win a Texas, billion Oklahoma dollar lottery, would be good. Yeah, yeah, Texas, Oklahoma yeah. Would be good to your point. That's yeah, that's I what like I was saying. One. Yeah, the Red River Shootout. Yeah, yeah that'd be a, a good, good game. And I think this year's game is going to be very interesting because I think they will most likely be the two te best teams in the Big Twelve this year. And how yeah. many more times are we going to see that as part of the Big Twelve? Not a lot, right? So I think that you know which one. Interesting. You know which one I've always wanted to see, which is kind of a weird one. I don't think they call it the Holy War anymore, but Utah BYU be kind oh, of. Oh, they still do. I think they still do. Those, yeah, I, think so. I, I, th I thought they changed it a couple years ago because something I forget, but that those fan bases hate each other, man. I yeah. would love to just be on a fly on the wall and just see fan interaction at that game. <laughs> like they do yeah. not like each other at all. Yeah, I hope they didn't change the. I hope they didn't I change they that. Did. That would be I lame. Could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I'm looking here. It says uh, it's still listed as the as the name given. There was another one that was called the yeah. Holy War that changed. Uh, uh, there was two. And I think it was a smaller school thing uh, that was called that. So uh, but yeah, I, I would hope that they would still be called that because that would be that would be really lame if they changed that. Uh, if they change that one, um, I yeah. guess Notre Dame so and just... D.C. used to be called that. So oh, did it? Really? I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Yeah. 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 So interesting. I don't know. Someone said the Virginia Tech entrance. I would like to see Enter Sandman when they're yeah. rocking at yeah. the stadium. It's, it's ESPN cool. has asked their employees to avoid using Holy War in their references to it, but they haven't changed the the rivalry gotcha. has not changed. So that's ESPN being ESPN, and we're gonna move that's, on from that conversation. That's but what I must have it's heard. The Holy War. It. So screw ESPN. All right, John Leahy says, B Ryan, out of the top 10 quarterbacks in the 23 class, who has the best and worst? scheme fit that's a really good question it's a really that's good question question i i, I think wow. i think look i i'll say this again i think nick i think nico going to tennessee was the best thing that he did he like i've said this mm -hmm. sometimes you make a de, you make the a, a decision for the wrong reasons but it mm -hmm. ends up being the right decision and i think nico went to tennessee because they gave him a huge deal like i think that's sure. why he picked tennessee however if nil wasn't a thing and I was simply advising him on what's the best place for you to go. Tennessee is one of my two to three because Josh Heupel's success in, in, in producing that type of quarterback. We've seen it at mm -hmm. UCF. We saw it especially last year with Hen Hooker. And, and so I think that was a, a great, great fit, scheme fit and coaching fit, because that's the thing for me is it's got to be that too. So 
They'll let him use his legs, but not necessarily build him as a like Hendon runs a lot, but they don't like run him a lot. You know what I mean? Like it's he got 600 plus yards last year, a lot of scrambles, you know, read zones where he's not like you're not running a ton of power. Oh, you know, Q power with Hendon Hooker. You know what I mean? And yeah. you're definitely not going to do the same thing with Nico. So that would be my fit for the best, the best one, Ryan. What would what would be your I, I like your word? I, I like I, I like Arch Manning in the te- in the Steve Sarkeesian yeah. offense. I mm-hmm. think that one makes a lot of sense. I mean, like they are creating and navigating a ton of space. I think that Arch is really good as far as the ball placement for the most part. I think he's got that tall frame. He's going to stand well in the pocket, do all this type of stuff. I really do like him in Sark's offense. I think that he yeah. He 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 found a uh, he found a really good fit in my opinion in that offense. Yeah, I mean, and and I think getting out of the SEC is good too. But to your, sure. we were talking about this in the show we did at CFB Nation the other day with John Garcia. And if you haven't checked it out, we we now have launched our CFB Nation podcast, so you can find that on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. CFB Nation, it's the one with the red, white, and blue logo, not the uh, black and yellow, red, white, and blue. Uh, so uh, you'll definitely want to use that. I'm going to say this: this is this is going to sound bad. Because it's going to sound like sour grapes. It really is. And I don't mean it to be. But I think the worst scheme fit is Dante Moore. I mean, here's all I I know of what Kenny Dillingham has done is what he's done at Tennessee or Memphis and Florida State. And neither of which showed me that he's going to be a fit, that Dante's a fit for what he wants to do there. So I just, um, I I thought that was a bad fit. I thought that was a bad fit for Dante. So... uh, the only other one that I thought was like a necessarily not a great fit was uh, Eli Holstein going to Bama just because that's an offense that relies on precision and timing and ball placement. And those are not strengths for Eli Holstein right now. So those are the two to me that are the worst fits. Like I thought Eli should have gone to Georgia where there's not mm-hmm. as much, you know, pow- you know, you're playing in a power system, you just play action, use your big arm, you know, don't have to be precise all the time. I thought he'd have been a better fit there. I don't think he's a guy that I see being a fit in Alabama's pro style system. So Dante and and uh, and uh, Eli Holstein are my two. You know who's a, who's actually a really good fit too. Now that I'm just like looking at the list, Jackson Arnold in Oklahoma is a really good fit. I mean, if we're on, and like yeah. you know, that, that Jeff, Jeff Levy offense, like yeah. I, I think that he's a pretty good fit overall. Yeah, I don't really have one that like pops out that's like a bad fit out i mean yeah. i think dante is a good one i think there's definitely fits that could have made a lot more sense i also like malachi nelson in, in usc if he's fixed there because yeah i mean in that in that air raid ish type of offense like that boy can can throw a deep ball man so like most I think of the well. most of the ones i've seen are good fits uh yeah. the one that i the another one that i didn't love did you see chris parsons the other day committed to mississippi state I did not see that. I, that one does oh, not make a lot of sense to me. In, in that in that super timing based offense, yeah. on scripts, not you're not really using his. Yeah, yeah, you're not using his legs. That one yeah. didn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I didn't quite That's understand that one. one. I didn't quite understand that one at all. So, but but in a lot of these others, like JJ Cold, Iowa State's a good fit. Jaden Rashad mm-hmm. at Miami is a you know from what I know, I mean he can he can, that's a good fit. You know Josh Gaddis from Michigan like to throw the ball down the field and he's got a big arm yeah. and the big kid Chris Vizina at Clemson's a good fit. Uh mm-hmm. you know, there's there's been a I haven't really had a lot of issues with oh wow, why fits. did that kid go? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So I just, you know, I think most of those fits are pretty good. I, I you know, I think I think Dante going to Oregon didn't make a lot of sense and mm-hmm. was a questionable decision, but we know why he made it. And mm-hmm. I don't I didn't like the Chris Parsons at Mississippi State one. That just doesn't doesn't seem like a good fit either. Yeah. And I like him I actually. I'll- I, yeah, like I like in the right too. offense, in the right offense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He needs to be in like a. Someone just said like Avery Day, Avery Johnson at Kansas State's a good fit. I agree, that's a good fit. I, he needs that type. Chris Parson needs that type of offense though, like that right. movement based system. Get him out. Let him kind of be him. You know, like don't take him out of his elements. Like Mississippi State's like one of the worst. Like you, you know who'd be good at Mississippi State? Dante Moore. Dante Moore would be great at Mississippi State. Like that would yes. be a phenomenal. Oh my thing. gosh! Yes. Fo- Getting the ball out of your hand super quick. Jackson yeah. Arnold would be pretty good at Mississippi State. Like those are the yeah. types of quarterbacks that are Mississippi State. Dante, especially because I think Jackson Arnold can have some issues with ball placement at times, yeah. especially when he's mm-hmm. pressured. And that air raid leaves the quarterback vulnerable. I think Dante handles that stuff really well. Like one of the reasons I love Dante, he can throw off platform, throw off script. He can kind of go sidearm and get around a pressure guy. Yeah. You know this, right? And those air raids, they'll just leave guys unblocked. And as a quarterback, 100%. it's your job to make a miss on a freaking post route. 
Like some of the shots that Jared Goff had to take in college, it was like designed where we're not blocking that guy. It's up to Jared to buy time and get the throw off. And yeah. and it's just a weird system. But I think Dante would throw for, a, I mean, 55, 5,800 yards in that system. That may seem like I'm being hyperbolic. I'm not. I mean, that that that's the kind of system that they do. I mean, what was the kid that yes. Washington State had a couple of years ago under Leach? Didn't he throw for over five? And that kid, Anthony oh, uh, Anthony, Anthony Gordon, Gordon right? Yeah, like that kid threw yeah. for what? What did he do a couple of years he, ago? He threw for like four K, I think. Five thousand five hundred seventy nine. Yeah, oh and forty eight touchdowns. Could you now again? Like the reason I think Dante's numbers will be similar is because he's be playing in the SEC, not the Pac twelve. Sure, right. So sure. 5,500 in the 5,500 in the pack 12 is, is more like 48, 49 mm -hmm. in the SEC. But he'd yeah. throw for a ton of yards in that all in that. I system. mean, just no just question. look at this, the numbers that uh, Will Rogers put up last year. And like, I know Will Rogers is not very talented, no. man. Like, no, he's, he's really not. not. No, he's not. Ugh. So I was reading some lists with him as like a top 10 quarterback. I'm like, the, the only way you can have him in that is if it's a if it's a it's just Strictly looking at numbers. production. Because yeah, yeah. he had 4,739 yards last year, 36 touchdowns and nine picks. It's like, no. And he's not very but good. He's not very good. He, look, he completed 73.9% of his passes for 4,739 yards. He averaged 6.9 yards per attempt. Yeah. Look, that's yep. that's not a lot of yards. I mean, Anthony that's Gordon, the year he was at Washington State, had 8.1 yards per attempt. Like, that's mm -hmm. where you want to be. That's that's much closer to where you want to be. There's, there's no doubt. Yeah. All right, Michael says, Brian and Ryan, uh, obviously Ronan has taken his talents to the Shrine of Dabo, but if you can only choose between Hannafin and J-Love, who and why, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. So I'll let you answer I, that one, Brian. I, I would pick I would pick Jeremiah Love. I would, because I think that there's one, Jeremiah Love, I think, can do more for your team, right? Like he can play running back. I think he can play wide receiver. He even thinks that he could play defense. And I – I, I've struggled with Ronan a little bit because, like, I really did think Ronan wanted to be with Notre Dame, but like, ultimately, he didn't pick Notre Dame, right? And, I, and right now, where we're standing, I we, we have to see what happens. But I think Jeremiah Love wants to be at Notre Dame, and I would yeah. call them the leader for him right now. And we'll see when the time time frame actually, you know, when the timeline ends, that type of thing, when the decision is ultimately made. But I really do think that Jeremiah Love wants to be at Notre Dame, and unfortunately, Ronan didn't. You know, like he wanted to. But he decided that it wasn't the best fit for him, so that yeah. I would I would opt for Jeremiah Love in this situation. Yeah, I, I think also Jeremiah Love's bring, brings more a little bit more offensive versatility. I think Ronan brings more yep. overall versatility. He could be a starter. He's a four star player on offense and defense. You know, he's a top hundred player sure. in my view on both sides of the ball, which then is why his overall ranking is even higher for me. I have him in the seventies because you just don't often have a guy that you recruit for receiver. He doesn't make it, and then you move him to safety or. Rover or right. linebacker, and he's a stud there too, you know. So, it, for this particular team, linebacker Rover wasn't a need. So I, I don't need that versatility as much. You've got Jaden Allsbury, you've got three safeties, you've got Drake Bowen and Preston Zinter. You don't need that versatility. You need a guy that can be a difference maker on offense. And I think Jeremiah Love brings that out of the backfield as a receiver. I think he can do a lot more things. And so, looking at it strictly that way, Ryan, I think that is kind of that is kind of where it would be. We are running out of time. So I do, I do want to get, I think this might be, this might be our last question. Cause Ryan, I know you got to leave around five. So I think yep. this might be last question, but I, I've, I've been actually, actually we missed a super chat from John Klimek. John, thank you for that. Thanks for the two reports, two weeks till we see. Uh, actually, did you oh, guys actually, talk about this one? We, did okay, not, we knocked this one out earlier. Okay, Thanks again good, though, John. Good, Appreciate good. It. Absolutely. Uh, so Alejandro, uh coronel says hey guys let's have some fun here what year do you truly believe notre dame has the best shot to win the title 22 23 24 or 25 we, we've talked about this one a bunch i would say for me it's 2023 and i think brian last time you may have said 2024 if i remember correctly as the most likely but i think it is 2023 because i'm just thinking of that sophomore class that i keep talking about Every single podcast at that point, they will be juniors. And there's no guarantee that after that year, that all of them will be back. So I'm looking at Tyler Buckner as a junior. I'm looking at Joe Alt as a junior, Blake Fisher as a junior, Logan Diggs as a junior, Audrick Estime as a junior, Lorenzo Styles as a junior. That's when I think you can potentially, I don't want to say peak, but like get to your highest point. So I'm going to say 2023. I, I still say this year because it's the one in front of me. That's just the coach. And I, and I think that there's a lot of things in place for Notre Dame. But there are also some 
roster issues that uh, um, are problems, you know, that you can't have this or can't have that, that the current freshman class and the incoming 23 and 24 should fix. If I had to go, if I had to go um, with a year, I still think 24 is, is the year for me of the three. I think it's 22, just because it's this one, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to have a bias on what's in front of me, right? And because that's the one I've spent more time matching up on. I haven't spent as much time evaluating what are other teams going to have in 24 and 23. You know, I mean, that's a big part of this, right? I mean, you can have a great team, but if, you're, if your great team happens to be the same year as 2019 LSU, guess what? You ain't winning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's the reality. You know, hey, we had a, Florida had a great team in 1995. Didn't matter. They had no shot against Nebraska. None. It's a terrible matchup. It's a really good Florida team. And, you know, so that's kind of the factor of it, too, is um, uh, what you're against. So I don't know as much about those two years. So I can only look from Notre Dame. I think 24 would be because you're going to be year three of Tyler Buckner. You know, like the, the Lorenzo Styles class, they'll be seniors, you know. So, you'll you know, maybe you have one of Alder Fisher back, maybe both. You know, Rock will be a senior. This current freshman class will be juniors. And then the 23 class will be sophomores, plus you'll have some influx of the 2024. So I think it's going to be a really talented team, like really fast, athletic. I mean, all your 4-3 guys in this class are going to be sophomores with a year of Matt Bayless under their belt that year. Uh, and, and then the schedule is going to be tough that year, but it's not, to me, as challenging as what I think next year's schedule is going to be, which is going to have a game at Clemson, home against Ohio State. You know, a and yep, you're at a and That's a tough game. At USC, you've got Miami at home. you got Florida State at home. I think it's going to be a, a little bit more manageable schedule. Uh, tough, but a little more manageable. I'm not a big believer in a and as you know. I would, I'm more concerned about playing Clemson in 23 at Clemson than I am a and in 24 at a and Both are good, tough games. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Bama just lost at a and right? It's not a cakewalk to go down to Kyle Field and, and win. I'm not saying that. But if I got to think about which one I have a better shot at, it's it's A&M in 24 than Clemson in 23, in in my view. Although next year Clemson is going to be is going to be losing a lot. They're going to be losing a lot from the because all, all these dudes we talk about on defense, they're most likely all gone next year. So you know, like I said, that's where I think I get to it. Ryan is like the schedule's got to matter in this conversation, right? Like that's a part. You can have a great team, but if your schedule's way too brutal. I mean, the 2017 was probably the second best team of the last five years. Would you disagree with that? They had, this, they had the worst regular season record of the of the of all the teams because they played seven ranked teams that year, six in the regular season. In 2019, Notre Dame went one and two against ranked teams. One and two. Last year they went zero and one. Last year's team playing the 2017 schedule, we're not talking about them being in the playoff hunt by October, much less in November. You know what I mean? So it's just that factors into it as well. But I think that 24 team has a chance to be loaded. So, Ryan, I think that's uh, I think that's all we have time for today. There was a lot of great questions, everybody. We are sorry we didn't get to any. I know there was one super chat we didn't get have a chance to get to, but uh, somebody has some, I, I think, some daddy duty responsibilities they got to get to. So, unfortunately, um, yep. and, uh, yeah. So, so why don't you go ahead and take us out of here, Ryan? Yeah, well, appreciate everybody again, Irish Breakdown Podcast. And before you leave for this free-for-all mailbag, we hope everybody enjoyed it. Make sure you like, share, subscribe to this podcast. Go on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star review. We really appreciate it. You see that link at the bottom there, boards.irishbreakdown.com. If you want to go check out the message board, we've got a lot of great intel on there. Please go to the store, buy some merch. It The season is only two weeks and a day away, so you need your IB gear on yes. game day. So. For myself, Ryan Roberts, for Brian Driscoll, thank and you all thanks, as and always. And thanks to Sean and Vince for stepping in today, being at practice and joining the show. Definitely big shout out to yes. both of those guys. So 100%. take us out. Sorry yep. about that, Ryan. Just wanted to thank no, no, you guys. Fine. So from Brian, Sean, Vince, I am Ryan Roberts. See you all next time on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.